I call this meeting of the Committee on Public Safety, Finance, and Policy to order. There is a quorum present. Um, as you know, we have a lot on our agenda today, and, and so in advance, thank you to everybody for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day for those who are Irish or those who wish they were Irish. Uh, see lots of green in the room today. The first order of business is to approve last minutes, or the last meeting's minutes from March 16th, 2023. Representative Mueller, would you like to move the minutes? Yes, I'd like to move uh, and approve the minutes from the last uh, meeting, March, gosh, when we were here yesterday, March 16th. <laughs> All right, uh, all those in favor of the minutes, please respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes from March 16th, 2023 are approved. Um, members, before we get into um, the bills today, I just wanted to make a couple of introductory remarks. Um, first of all, for all the bills today, as we've done this week, anybody who wants to sign up to testify from the public signed up in advance, so we won't be just calling on people in the room to testify today. The first half of our agenda today is really going to be addressing the opioid crisis, specifically um, with fentanyl. And uh, when Representative Baker brought me into this discussion um, when session started, I um, really appreciated that he did that. And we started talking about how we could tackle this crisis. Um, and there are many different things that we have to consider. You know, this is the Public Safety Committee, and so his bill talks about increasing penalties. But we also want to recognize this for the public health crisis that it is. And a lot of the different bills that are moving in the legislature on this issue, things that we're talking about beyond just criminal penalties, are prevention and intervention, substance use disorder treatment, education of students, um, availability of naloxone, availability of fentanyl test strips, all of these things are critically important and they don't always come to our committee. So we have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. I know Representative Hewitt had a bill to provide um, that all EMS providers carry naloxone. That was amended on in another committee earlier this week. Um, you'll hear from Representative Baker that we're going to make sure law enforcement has naloxone available um, with an amendment that we're going to put onto his bill today. There's also bills moving on uh, making sure that that's also available in our schools. Again, not coming into our committee, but part of the overall um, picture. We also want to make sure that we're working to prevent um, this from even happening in the first place. You're going to hear from at least one testifier today who's doing good work in our schools to educate our youth about this. Um, and then you're going to hear from Representative Baker about the ORAC and what they're doing um, to provide funding to be able to help increase education and um, intervention. And then I just also want to say that we know the war on drugs has failed. And so what we're doing today, I truly feel, is a Band-Aid. Um, it's something that we need to do when we talk about increasing penalties for the dealers, but we don't feel like it's a long-term solution. We have to be thinking comprehensively of, of all of these things. And one of the uh, other bills we're going to be hearing today is a Representative Pinto bill that can really help us think about sort of long-term strategy, how we deal with issues like that. So with that, I am going to stop talking um, and we're going to start with public testimony. And what we decided to do for all of these bills related to the opioid epidemic was to have the public testimony up front. So then we'll hear from those folks before we move in to a discussion about ORAC and the individual bills on our agenda. Um, and so with that, um, we have Tracy Anderson from the Minnesota Prevention and Recovery Alliance. She's Madam Chair, available. Madam Chair. Yes, Can go I ahead, say Representative thing? Baker. And if, if I could, thank you for that opening. And I just, I did have a chance to reach out to you or Ellen. I was wondering if we could just change the order a little bit of the testimony, only because I wanted to start with some family testimony to really kind of help set the tone, if that's all right with you, Madam <coughs> Chair. Um, I know Tracy's stuff is important, and I, I, I again, I'm assuming she's here, but I, I just wanted to see if that was possible. Well, Tracy's our only remote testifier, oh, thank so you. if it's okay, if we can just do that. Yes. And then if you want to have a different, uh, make a note of the order you want and, and let Ellen know, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so we'll begin with Tracy Anderson. Um, please state your name and begin your testimony. <laughs> Looks like you're muted still, Tracy. Well, we might have to switch up the order. 
<laughs> okay, well, give it one more time. Tracy, you're still muted. All right, we see you, but I, can, I think you might be muted still. We just are. All right, well, let's get this figured out. And um, Representative Baker, who would you like the first testifier to be? Um, Madam Chair, I'd love to have uh, Jeff and Michelle Lobert come forward. All right, great. Yeah, Jeff and Michelle Lobert, come on forward. And then you can introduce yourself for the record, please, and begin your testimony. And as they make their way up, Madam Chair and members, um, there was a handout given to you, um, the faces of fentanyl, and I, I wanted to alert you of a, of a mistake I made last night putting these together and circling the wrong picture of, uh, of Tristan. Tristan is the one circled in the middle. That actually is not Tristan. Tristan's on the other side of the page. Um, and his uh, dad will likely point that out in a little bit too, so I just wanted to point that out. But this is, this is why we're here. So I wanted to just set that up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. You can introduce yourself and begin. Hi, my name is Michelle Wilberg. This is my husband, Jeff. And do you mind moving the mic a little closer? Great. Speaking of, there we go. My name is Michelle Loberg. This is my husband, Jeff. Um, I want to thank Representative Baker and Representative Novotny and my Sherburne County um, for always listening to us. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I'm here to talk to you about the fentanyl poisoning. Of our son, Nicholas, on October 12th, 2020. He was 20 years young. I walked into Nick's bedroom that evening at 9.15 to say goodnight and he was unconscious on his floor. The horror and shock of that are indescribable. I called 911, screaming for my husband to come downstairs. He immediately started CPR and administered Narcan while I stayed on the phone on my front porch, screaming until help arrived. We waited in our living room while they tried to revive our son. Despite the best efforts, Nick did not make it, and our hearts were shattered. Over two years later, we are left to try to heal from the loss of our son, and our two daughters are shattered over the loss of their little brother, and our family is broken. Nick had been home from treatment for a month. The experience of a child that is having problems with substance use is not for the faint of heart. It is a journey of ups and downs, trials and triumphs for them and for the family. But never in a million years did we think that we would lose our son and let alone lose him to fentanyl. Nick was a fun and sweet kid who grew into a handsome young man. He loved to be outside, to cook and draw. His two older sisters loved having a baby brother. We had a happy and wonderful family of five. We loved our children, gave them a good, happy home, and it was important for us to spend time together, camping, traveling, spending time at our cabin. As Nick got into middle and high school, he did struggle with anxiety, as many young teens do, and we took many measures to get him the right help. He had a therapist, a psychiatrist in his late teens. He had several prescriptions to help him with anxiety and sleep. But he felt it wasn't doing enough, and he would supplement with weed, which eventually progressed into other drugs. He had been in inpatient treatment three times over a period of three years, and outpatient treatment following each of those. Despite his struggles with substance use disorder, we never stopped loving or supporting our son. He had a steady girlfriend for three years who deeply loved and supported him as well. They had hopes and dreams, and they were planning their young ones. 
looking forward to a home and family together. And we were looking forward to that too. In an instant, those hopes and dreams were abruptly cut short by illicit fentanyl. Imagine how traumatic it is to have a loved one alive and with you one second and dead the next. There are many families like ours in Minnesota and across the country. We are all grieving, replaying the day our loved ones died over and over. It hits every day. And what is happening to the dealers that sold them the fentanyl? In most cases, they are living their lives untouched by the devastation they have caused. Maybe a court appearance or a slap on the wrist. I am praying that my testimony helps you decide to vote yes to House File 615 so that fentanyl possession and distribution be charged equal to that of heroin. This is the least we can do to help curb these dealers from thinking they are untouchable in the eyes of the law. This bill would send a message to them, the message that they are not invincible and they will be charged for their crimes and go to prison. Don't make a decision based on politics. Make a decision based on what is right. It is right to charge people who break laws. It is right to charge people who knowingly or unknowingly <coughs> cause death. There is no penalty that is too harsh for fentanyl crimes. This is not a moral issue, a race issue, or social issue. It is a red, white, and blue issue, a Minnesota issue, and time is of the essence. When you go home today, try to really think how it would feel to be us or these hundreds of other families in Minnesota. Whole one minute, ripped apart the next. Having your child's ashes on your mantle. Having the last picture you took of them now be their forever age photo. You never get to see them grow old. Then think of the person that sold the drugs. They are walking amongst you and your family in the world and you have no recourse. You just hope and pray that the laws in place will give you some justice. The dealer gets to be alive with choices, but you have no choice but to live with the aftermath of your child's death. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Please help us. I urge members to pass House File 615. In the words of Rebecca Keesley, another mother who lost two sons to fentanyl on the same day, she said, United we stand, divided we fall. And I would like to add that it's our children that are falling victim to the deceit of drug dealers and the fatal result of illicit fentanyl. But united, we can make a difference. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, our sincere sympathies to you and appreciation for you sharing your testimony. Thank you for letting us be here. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Representative job. Baker, we're, uh, we, ha we do have Tracy ready now, but is there somebody else you'd rather have Go come right first? Ahead. Okay. Um, I think we'll try this again. Tracy Anderson, welcome. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Tracy Anderson, and I'm one of the lucky ones. I, I've been in recovery from opioid use disorder for 10 years. Um, today, I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Prevention and Recovery Alliance. We are a community-based nonprofit organization that provides prevention education and peer recovery support services to both youth and adults. Our youth prevention program, Know the Truth, facilitates evidence-based prevention services in over 300 schools in our state. Our peer-to-peer -peer approach strives to change the mindset of Minnesota's youth regarding substances. Our presenters who are close in age to the students share their lived experience of substance use and recovery. After hearing our presentation, students are five times less likely to try substances. We also provide peer recovery support services in schools, leading support groups for students who are in recovery, struggling with a family member's use, or are seeking recovery for their own substance use. This has resulted in preventing use, students discontinuing using, and reaching their own personal recovery goals. 
We strongly support this committee's efforts in increasing the penalties for dealers and distributors of fentanyl and other poisonous substances in our state. However, I urge this committee to also focus on prevention, changing the mindset of potential consumers of this poison. We also lead the Ramsey County Opioid Prevention and Unified Services Coalition, funded by the Center for Disease Control and SAMHSA, as well as many other community-based initiatives, partnering with law enforcement and other government officials. Any law enforcement officer you ask will tell you that we simply cannot arrest our way out of this problem. The Know the Truth Prevention Program works, and we're doing as much as we can to educate as many youth as possible. To date, we've reached over 1 million Minnesota youth. This is all without reliable state funding. Due to resources, we have to say no to schools seeking our prevention efforts. In closing, I'd like to support this, this effort and also state that this crisis is not going away. In fact, the substances coming into our state are only getting stronger and our youth are playing Russian roulette with their lives. So we need to put a full force effort on prevention, changing the mindset not to use these substances. We're here as a resource to this committee and to our state. Thank you for allowing me to share this morning. Thank you so much for your testimony. We appreciate it. Um, all right, Representative Baker, who do you have next for us here? Madam Chair, uh, Brian and Carrie Hillgardner would be next. Thank you. All right, great. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourselves and begin your testimony. Thank you, um, Brian Hillgardner and my wife, Carrie Hillgardner. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the Public Safety Committee, thank you for having us here today. Uh, my name again is Brian Hillgardner. Uh, my wife, Carrie, and I reside in Cottage Grove. We have five amazing young adults that we've raised as a blended family since 2012. We lost our oldest son, Tristan, on December 17, 2021. He was only 19 years old. I'm here today because we need to realize that opioid abuse is truly a pandemic. We are all here specifically to discuss fentanyl. Fentanyl is a powerful, dangerous opioid that needs stricter laws and punishment to begin correcting a crisis that is escalating at an unprecedented rate. I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about my son. As a baby, Tristan never stopped smiling. It was evident early on that he was going to love sports. He had several footballs as a toddler. It could, it could tell you nearly every NASCAR driver by looking at the sponsors on the car. He became a Patriots fan at age five because of their jersey color and against his dad's Vikings will <laughs> and proceeded to be a number one fan of a football dynasty. He stood in line for three hours the first day he was eligible to get pads and play real football. He truly had a passion for football and sports. He loved family, he absolutely loved holidays. He even made several appearances as Santa in his later teen years. Tristan was comedy on wheels, essentially the class clown. Everyone migrated to be around Tristan because of his loving and fun nature. He simply was the light within a room. In 2020, much of this began to change. He graduated but was changing jobs often. He became more distant at times. My wife and I, mainly my wife, was always snooping with our kids in their rooms and, and we would find things like marijuana and other, and other dangerous drugs, but we didn't know what things were. And so we, we tried, you know, we tried to talk and, 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 and reason. But like every other parent, we didn't think our kids would do anything that bad. We had them lined up and, and did some counseling and we even had them lined up for some in-house treatment but we were on a waiting list because of COVID capacity. <clears throat> I was absolutely blindsided on December 17th, 2021. I lost my son. I lost my baby boy. I lost my best friend. Only now do I understand how dangerous and prevalent fentanyl is. It's not just in the big cities, it is everywhere. It became very evident with talking with his friends how, how prevalent the drugs are within the high schools and within the area. His core group of friends all noticed the similar changes that last year of Tristan's life. However, he still played enough basketball games, fantasy football, and Xbox to mask his illness with them. 
He was beloved so much by that group of friends, they shoveled a foot of snow off their favorite basketball court and played a game the day after he died in his honor. We also got t-shirts and 30 of his friends and family attended the Vikings Patriots game this past Thanksgiving. Holiday gatherings now have an empty chair. A son, a grandson, cousin, nephew, no longer providing that glow and laughter. He impacted so many people, if he only knew. I have some national statistics here. Fentanyl is the newest wave of dangerous opioids and is 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more powerful than morphine. Yet the possession and sales penalties are far greater for other drugs, other opioids. In 2013, approximately 4,000 people died of fentanyl overdose in the nation. In 2021, just eight years later, 70,000 people died of fentanyl overdose. An increase of 66,000 annual deaths in eight years. 25% higher than the death total in 2020. And 87.5% of opioid overdoses in 2021 in the nation were due to fentanyl. That's staggering. So why is it that the possession and sales penalties are far greater for, for heroin than fentanyl? I fail to understand any rational explanation why a person should not be charged for fentanyl sale or possession any differently than heroin. In closing, before you vote on Bill HF 615, I implore you to look at the faces on the posters that were made for this cause. They are real people. My son was a real person. Think about the experiences and memories many of these young people could have had in front of them. They will never get the opportunity to do those things. They don't get a second chance, but you have a chance to make a difference. You have a chance to make a difference. Be a leader, pass this bill. Lastly, think about the families that have lost loved ones and are left in disarray with gaping holes in their hearts. Help bring justice to these families. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And again, our deepest sympathies to you and your family and our gratitude for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we have Chris Murray, the legal director at Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. Welcome, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, I was not planning to do this testimony this morning. Our, our chief of police was planning to be here, but unfortunately we had a missing child on the reservation and so he's um, doing search and rescue today. Um, so I will do my best to take his place, but he certainly has uh, more experience than I do with the issues, uh, fentanyl issues on the reservation. Um, but uh, just to start out, uh, just point out that the Native American population suffer the worst rate of overdose of all Minnesota demographics and disparities are increasing. Uh, since 2018, the rate per 100,000 for Native American Minnesotans has increased from 64 in 2018 to 192 in 2021 as far as uh, mortality from opioids. Um, so tripling in, th <clears throat> in three years. Um, the rate for white Minnesotans is, is 19 per 100,000 deaths annually. Um, the lethal dose of heroin is estimated around 200 milligrams and the lethal dose of fentanyl is two milligrams. And so that's uh, the same amount of fentanyl can kill 100 people, 100 times as many people as, as heroin. And yet um, until this bill is passed, fentanyl wouldn't even be charged at the same, uh, as the same crime as heroin. Unfortunately, that's due to many factors, um, but I think that this bill will help make up some of that gap and, and really provide some tools for law enforcement and, and the courts to address, especially the uh, dealing and the out-of-state dealers that come in. Um, just as an example, um, recently there were two men from Detroit that were charged in federal, or charged in uh, district court in Bemidji for fentanyl distribution, they received less than five years in jail and they were caught with 174 grams of fentanyl. 
That's enough to kill 1,740 people. Uh, another issue that we're noticing on the reservation is that uh, the fentanyl, especially folks that are using a lot of fentanyl, aren't responding to Narcan when they do have overdoses. So that's increasing the number of deaths from, over, from overdoses. The reservation's been seeing multiple dozens of overdoses a week and, and at least one death a week over the last several months. Um, recently, we had an employee at the grocery store in Cass Lake that's owned by the Leech Lake Band. Um, she actually uh, had to be treated for fentanyl overdose because she was passed a bill that had been soaked in liquid fentanyl. And uh, apparently, hand sanitizer actually makes, uh, if, you, if you have hand sanitizer on your hands and you touch something that has fentanyl on it, the alcohol in the hand sanitizer will cause your body to absorb that fentanyl. And so um, luckily, that employee made it. She was able to be treated successfully. Um, but she did go into an overdose based on handling money, you know, doing her job. So um, you know, I, I certainly don't have the impactful emotional stories that we've heard from some of the other testifiers. I'm sure we'll hear more. Um, but you know, just a few facts to leave you guys with. Um, in 2019, across Minnesota, there were 309 deaths from synthetic opioids. In 2021, there were 834. And uh, that increase is mostly due to fentanyl because in 2019, there was 427 total fatal opioid overdoses. And in 2021, 978. So the number of non-synthetic opioid overdoses has really kind of remained steady in that the synthetic opioids like fentanyl have really um, pushed that rate higher. So um, for these reasons, I uh, implore you all to support HF 615 um, to increase the penalties for fentanyl and bring them at least up to the same level as heroin. Thank you. Thank you, Director Murray. Um, next, we have Alicia House and Steve Rumler. Oh, sorry. All right. Hi, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Alicia House, and I'm the executive director of the Steve Rumler Hope Network. Uh, if you're not familiar, Rumler has been a pioneer of the opioid overdose and awareness in the state of Minnesota since 2011. Since we have worked tirelessly to make resources equitable and accessible, every year we've reached all 87 counties in Minnesota. Together we've distributed over 250,000 doses of naloxone, 100,000 fentanyl testing strips, and trained over 20,000 Minnesotans. Steve's law, also known as the Good Samaritan law in the state of Minnesota, was passed in 2014. This allowed all public safety, fire, police, and EMS to carry and administer naloxone. Almost a decade later, there are still departments that do not carry why. We know stigma in education is still a leading factor. Police officers are often the first people to arrive on the scene of an overdose, and they are in a unique position to administer naloxone quickly, potentially saving a life. Rumler has been a leading advocate in cutting down barriers by bringing resources, education, and no-cost services to these groups. We turn no one away and work tirelessly to provide to anyone in the state. This even includes mailing to homes and businesses every single day. We built out toolkits for schools, which have been used to onboard dozens of districts and law enforcement to walk them through this process of implementing a policy, receiving a training, and obtaining product. Public safety carrying naloxone though goes deeper than the surface level. When our EMS, police, and fire carry, it sends a message to their community that their lives matter and are worthy of saving. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, that was all of the public testifiers that we had signed up. And uh, we will move now to an update from Representative Baker on the ORAC. And Representative Baker, we're a little bit behind time, so if you sure can give us the, uh, not that it's not important, but thank no, you. And thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if we can take over the screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, um, uh, back in 2019, members, uh, I was part of a very remarkable group of legislators that worked in a bipartisan fashion in both bodies. Um, uh, Representative Olson and I were on the House side. We passed House File uh, 400, which created the uh, Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council. Since then, uh, I have been fortunate enough to be on the council uh, as a member appointed by the speaker, and I'm currently sitting as the chair, and I work very closely with DHS and how they manage this 
19-member uh, uh, statewide uh, group of people that really, I, I've always referred to this as our motherboard in, in this issue. Um, everything revolves around different spokes of how do we address the opioid crisis, talking to our medical facilities, having the right people at the table. And what we're going to be doing today is a part of the fix, I think, to help us get there. It is, uh, as you mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, we are not going to arrest our way out of this issue at all. But your work today is going to be really vital for us. I just want to give a quick overview of what ORAC has done. So far on the dashboard, you'll see there, we have so far uh, delivered and granted out $24 million. And that has been mostly from licensing fee reform that we did. The pharmaceutical companies now pay more money to sell pharmaceuticals in the state of Minnesota. We were one of the very first in the country to take the $250 per year that a pharmaceutical could sell as much as, much as they wanted to. Um, I'm in a bar, I'm in the, I was in the bar business, and so we spent a lot of money for one bar to sell one beer. Uh, we took kind of the same model, if you will, to use that same thinking that if you um, uh, want to sell something that creates problems in our society, we ought to have some cushion there to give our resources to police and fire and, and to the medical community to have some resources to do that. So now you sell a, a pharmaceutical of any kind in Minnesota, it's a minimum of $5,000 a year. If you sell opioids, it's $50,000 a year. Now, if you're a super seller and, and you're a distributor and a generic, you are going to pay $250,000 a year in Minnesota to provide this medicine. So right now, we're collecting about $15 million in Minnesota. It wasn't easy to get there. Pharmaceuticals kind of fight back a little bit, believe it or not, but we got it there. And we're working really well with them. And it was a bipartisan thing. There's a sunset clause to this item. We are now and have anticipated lawsuit dollars coming into Minnesota. And those are now just starting to come into Minnesota. And ORAC, with our, with our forward-thinking legislation, is capturing some of that in a separate fund that, believe it or not, legislators aren't supposed to touch. And that was a good thing. Now, you can change that, but I hope we never do that if this, if this council of ours keeps doing their work. Most recently, you might have heard of some lawsuits coming in through the state uh, with the larger uh, wholesaler distributors, uh, McKesson, Cardinal Health, uh, some of the larger ones. And, and Minnesota is receiving about $280 million over the next 18 years that has been carefully thought through about how are we going to split this up. 25% of that is going to come to this group called ORAC. Again, we have the ability, the authorization by you, to give this and grant it out carefully through DHS granting process. The other 75% of that dollars are going right to your counties. So every one of our counties that we sit in are getting lots and lots of money over the next 18 years from that first round of lawsuits. I will tell you we're very close to signing the next one too. Attorney General's office has been working very closely with ORAC, with uh, the American, uh, the uh, Association of Minnesota Counties and, and League of Cities. We are working together to make sure that our uh, local use is getting to the right place as well. Uh, but again, we're taking in a lot of revenue. You'll see here where the money is somewhat going. We're really focusing in on uh, you know, prevention, education. You heard about Tracy Anderson and her work with uh, uh, Know the Truth. There's Change the Outcome as another organization that does a lot of stuff in our schools. There's no charges to the schools when we do this. Uh, the Rumler Foundation has received a lot of money from us to make sure that Nar Narcan is available to people when they need it at no charge. Testing strips are available. We are doing a lot in harm reduction areas. So I think just high level overall, we are trying our very best to get it out to the state of Minnesota because the, the need is real. We've got to get education, but we've got to be able to save people if they need it. So I'm um, extremely proud of the work of our 19 members in ORAC. In fact, when I'm done here, uh, I need to scoot out because we have a meeting uh, over at the Elmer Anderson building today. We're going to be um, running our, our next meeting and we're getting ready for our largest RFP uh, granting coming out because we're finally going to get into our settlement dollars and our licensing fee. We're going to be doing another $25 million here in June. So we're going to try to get together and do an annual large RFP. So we're going to basically double our work in one year after the last three years. And so we have a lot of work to do and it's a very complex scoring system. We're very careful about who gets the dollars. Um, and there's a lot more I could, I could talk about, again, uh, Madam Chair, but we are stretched for time. If anybody wants to know, again, even what their counties are getting, for example, Hennepin County in the first round of, of the lawsuits is going to receive $42 million in the next 18 years. 
and they have to decide through their public health and their, their process how they want to support their community. City of Minneapolis alone will get 10.8 million. And there's more coming. We're getting ready to almost double this number because of the next round with CBS and Walmart and so on. Uh, again, uh, we are working very closely with the Attorney General's office to work those memos of, un of understanding to get our county uh, boards agreeing with all this. I, I can't tell you, it's, it's extremely complex about what we're doing, but the state of Minnesota is really focused on helping families with this. Um, and again, uh, with that, Madam Chair, um, if members have questions about ORAC and it's another time, I can absolutely take it uh, to my office on another time. But um, mm -hmm. I'd love to be able to get to the bill, Madam Chair, and we can do that. But um, again, ORAC uh, stands for action. We really want to do a lot of good things, but it is a very fluid and we need to stay nimble. And I think we need to make sure that um, our work here uh, is very upfront with it. And uh, again, I cannot thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing this bill to come forward and the way we worked on it together. We had a lot of morning meetings with a lot of very smart people. You'll meet a few of them here coming up in a few minutes. But um, I just cannot thank you for your support on it. You know how important this was to a lot of us. And, and uh, thank you, and I look forward to uh, presenting the bill. Thank you so much. And we, we do appreciate your leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, very much on this issue. So with that, we'll move on to House File 615. I will move to lay over House File 615. Representative Baker has a DE3 amendment. I will move your amendment uh, to get the bill in the shape you would like it heard. And because it's a DE, we'll just move straight to a vote on the DE amendment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, and the DE3 amendment is adopted. Representative Baker, please tell us about your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, House, House File 615 is a work um, that took, a, again, a, a very interesting dialogue. Um, I've got some really amazing people that helped us along the way here. Um, Nathan and Shane will tell you who they are, what they did, what they do, and why we needed to do this kind of a change um, uh, in the law today. Um, what I want to make sure we do is we, we are talking about sale and possession today. First and second degree, it has always been our goal to make sure we do not want to penalize folks that are just really just struggling with substance use disorder. We want to find a line that works for us to make sure that we, 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 we punish the right people, not people that are just struggling and are trying to get through life. We, have, we are reaching out to them in different ways. But we're going to talk about the definitions today. We're going to talk about uh, the sale possessions. But we're getting it to a level that I'm very, very proud of, that we will be able to uh, be able to say in Minnesota that not every state will have this, but we're ready for this. And we want to we put a big um, stick in the ground to make sure that anybody that wants to come and try to do this in Minnesota be ready to pay the price. I think we're ready to deal with this now. And uh, uh, we've got the right people at the table. The, the bill is written, I think, in a, in a very nice way. Madam Chair, I'd like to have uh, uh, my testifiers take over their areas, please. Sounds good. First up, we have Nathan Benusa, Assistant County Attorney, Sherburne County Attorney's Office. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Yes, thank you, Chair Moeller. Uh, my name is Nathan Benusa. I'm Assistant County Attorney in Sherburne County. I've been working with uh, legislators uh, probably the last three years on trying to get a bill of this nature uh, passed. I can say as well and speak on behalf of the Minnesota County Attorney's Association. Uh, they are also in support of this bill. Um, from a prosecutor perspective, I kind of laid down why this bill is important. In 2016, there was essentially an overhaul to the controlled substance uh, laws. At that time, there are obviously more severe substance, in particular heroin, is punished more severely at a lower threshold than, let's say, methamphetamine or cocaine. So at that time, it made sense because obviously drug dealers and distributors are going to have smaller amounts of heroin needed um, to get uh, their customer base more essentially high, so then it makes more sense to have the more potent and lethal drugs be punished more severely. Uh, obviously, at that time when that bill was introduced, it wasn't anticipated that the next seven years would be as they were, and we weren't, they weren't uh, anticipating the effect that fentanyl would have on the uh, United States and Minnesota in particular. So I think now, as you've heard from various testifiers today already, that fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than uh, even heroin. So at this point in our laws, heroin's punished more severely, but fentanyl is even behind uh, chemicals such as cocaine and methamphetamine. So the aim of this law is to put it at least on level with heroin so that when we're seeing drug distributors and dealers in court, we're able to 
to prosecute them to the level that they should be getting prosecuted at. As a drug prosecutor and having spoken to many of these drug prosecutors throughout the state, it's been fairly frustrating the last, especially the last couple of years when these fentanyl pills have become so prevalent to prosecute these crimes knowing that we're barely getting to even a first degree level for the highest offenders. I can speak personally, the uh, biggest case that I've had thus far, and I deal um, almost exclusively in drug prosecution was a case where we uh, found a drug dealer with 600 pills. And this was after a search warrant and we had done uh, what's considered a controlled buy. What that means is you use a CI and you purchase drugs from this dealer. So what happened was this is we did three controlled buys with this dealer, had a GPS on his car so we knew he was going back and forth from his uh, distributor probably once a week. So we knew he was getting at least probably 500 pills a week. We execute the search warrant, find 600 pills. But the current laws, we were barely able to charge him with a first degree uh, sale. So we're talking about, excuse me, one of the highest uh, distributors in St. Cloud at that time, we were barely able to prosecute him with a first degree sale. So I think I can't emphasize enough the importance from a prosecutor standpoint to get these thresholds higher. And having worked with Representative Baker and Representative Mueller, we've found a compromise where the goal is to get these drug distributors and dealers and not deal with the users. So I think this bill, from a prosecutor's perspective, will accomplish that today or in the future, where we're punishing the dealers, getting them on level with where they should be at now, considering the lethal and deadly effects that fentanyl has had on the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Shane Meyer. Welcome uh, to the committee. I'll just say both of you have been in these early morning meetings. I've not met you in person, so I'm picturing you at 7.30 in the morning on Zoom. <laughs> it's nice to see you in person. Uh, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and members, my name is Shane Myrie. I'm a detective with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, and I'm also the president of the Hennepin County Sheriff Deputies Association. I'm here this morning as a member of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association, or MPPOA Board of Directors, and we strongly support House File 615. As the family testimonies demonstrate from earlier in the hearing, fentanyl is here on the streets in Minnesota. It's on Main Street, it's on the side streets, it's in the back alleys, and it is lethal. According to a recent 2023 annual threat assessment of the US intelligence community, transnational criminal organizations have flooded the US with cheap counterfeit pills containing fentanyl. Administrator Milligram, who is the current administrator of the US Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA, has said fentanyl is the single deadliest drug threat our nation has ever encountered. And Dr. Rao Gupta, the director of President Biden's Office of National Drug Control Policy, testified to Congress in February that we must comprehend that the ground has shifted beneath us in relation to the drug supply environment. He further testified that the age of small volume, high potency synthetic drug production has clearly begun. Madam Chair and members, fentanyl is a game changer. It's 50 times more potent than heroin, and we have not seen anything like this before in Minnesota. According to the Minnesota Investigative Support Center, within the North Central High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA, covering Minnesota and Wisconsin, we know that opioids, especially fentanyl, continue to pose the greatest threat as a large percentage of overdose fatalities involve this class of drugs. We also know that fentanyl is produced primarily outside of the U.S. and it is sent and are transported to Minnesota, where it arrives in a variety of forms, including fentanyl powder and fentanyl lace fake prescription medications like counterfeit oxycodone or Mbox pills and counterfeit Xanax pills. In 2020, a handful of narcotics task forces and drug interdiction teams in Hennepin County seized about 1,100 grams of fentanyl powder and nearly 3,500 fentanyl pills. In 2021, that same group, those same groups seized approximately 1,900 grams of fentanyl powder and 35,000 pills. In 2022, it was over 10,000 grams of fentanyl powder and over 630,000 fentanyl pills. And during the first six weeks of 2023 alone, 
these groups had already seized over 5,200 grams of fentanyl powder and nearly 160,000 fentanyl pills. In addition to the seizure numbers I just mentioned, preliminary reporting in Hennepin County indicates that since the beginning of 2023, there have been over 500 suspected non-fatal overdoses and nearly 40 suspected overdose deaths. Statewide, our law enforcement partners are encountering the same trends and incidents in their local jurisdictions. In 2022, the Rochester Police Department seized nearly 80 pounds of powder fentanyl and nearly 40,000 fentanyl pills. Over the past few years, law enforcement in the St. Cloud area has seen increases in overdoses. In 2021, 60 reported overdoses, 38 were fentanyl related, 10 were fatal. In 2022, 73 reported overdoses, 63 were fentanyl related, 13 were fatal. And so far this year in 2023, 29 overdoses, 24 were fentanyl related, and there have been six OD deaths, all fentanyl related. During a recent conversation I had with a night shift patrol sergeant on the Duluth Police Department, they said they encounter at least one overdose every shift. Our tribal police partners are seeing similar trends. Our tribal police partners in central Minnesota over the last 12 months have seized 17,000 fentanyl laced counterfeit prescription pills and they've responded to over 56 ODs and seven OD deaths. I know that recently Red Lake tribal leaders held a round table with U.S. Attorney Andy Luger and they discussed fentanyl trafficking on the reservation. And lastly, according to a recent media reporting, Metro Transit recently issued a memo to all staff regarding passenger welfare checks. And it stated, due to a recent rise in overdoses, staff should not assume individuals who appear to be asleep are not in need of medical attention. The memo went on to talk and further discuss the signs of overdoses. Madam Chair and members, these are just a handful of examples of what law enforcement is seeing on the streets of Minnesota every day. In closing, in 2022, of the fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills recovered and analyzed by DEA laboratories nationwide, they estimate that six out of 10 have a potentially fatal dose of fentanyl, which is an increase from four out of 10 pills in 2021. To alert the public about these dangers, the DEA created a national campaign called One Pill Can Kill, and their message is this. Never take a pill that wasn't prescribed directly to you. Never take a pill from a friend. Never take a pill you bought on social media. Just one pill is dangerous and one pill can kill. I encourage everyone in this committee, I encourage everyone in this committee room and everybody watching the hearing online to review this information and discuss it with family members, friends and associates. Madam Chair and members, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we will move on to member discussion now. We are running a little behind schedule, but I wanted to make sure all the testifiers had a full opportunity. Um, to testify today. So with that, member discussion. Chair becker uh, Thank you, Chair Muller. And, and I actually wanted to lift up Section 7 of the DE3, which is uh, requiring officers and uh, LEOs require their officers to carry Narcan and, and be trained in how to use it. Um, I, I, I just think as we see this as a holistic issue and remembering, you know, I think sometimes when people think of people who use drugs, they think of just the crime or they're uh, diminishing who that person is as a person. And as you know, we heard in the testimony and we know that these are people who are addicted and these are people who are struggling. And um, I know there are departments right now who are not carrying Narcan and, and or choosing not to use it. And um, we should all be interested in saving lives around this issue. And as, as we heard from uh, the testifier from Leech Lake, um, you know, our Native communities are uh, disproportionately impacted by this epidemic for a lot of different reasons. And I think this does overlap a bit with our, our discussions around law enforcement authority and our ability to enforce the laws uh, statewide. So um, just wanted to lift up the Narcan um, piece. I, I have a family member who, um, because a tribal police officer got there quickly um, and used Narcan, was actually um, an, an elderly uh, family member, but uh, with the interaction of the, the medications he was on, um, 
ended up overdosing on opioids, uh, you know, prescribed medication, but it interacted in a way that wasn't expected. And because that, that Leech Lake officer had Narcan, um, my uncle is still with us. So I, I just uh, wanted to lift up that piece since it hadn't been mentioned uh, in the testimony. So thank you. Thank you. Further member discussion? Representative Ingen. Thank you, Chair Muller, and thank you, Representative Baker, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I'm in full support, but I just had a, a quick question for you, um, or maybe it's for somebody else, but um, the supply chain, where are we seeing that um, the DEA and the state task force, where are they finding the easiest and most accessible means of intake? Where are these drugs um, most likely to be found um, as they come into Minnesota here? Uh, Mr. Madam, Meyer. Yeah, Madam Chair and Representative Engen, um, it's all coming from south of the border, right? I think at a high level, there's precursor chemicals that are coming in from China and overseas. They're coming to south of our border. That's where pills are getting pressed or powders getting put together, and it's coming up through the border. It can be transported by vehicle, train. It can come through the mail. It can come through commercial carrier. It's coming in um, from all sides. I think the kind of the lingo in the law enforcement world, when it comes to fentanyl, every state's a border state because it's here and it's coming in through all directions. So that's how it's coming in. Representative again. Thank you, I couldn't agree more. And we should look at making sure that we're providing the necessary equipment, tools, and um, resources that these folks need to, to find it. Like you said, every state's a border state. So thank you for yep. that information. Yeah, and I'll just note when I started to work with this uh, issue with Representative Baker, just turned on the TV one night and on CNN, um, Anderson Cooper was doing a town hall and um, uh, President Biden had the DEA, um, the head of the DEA there, and they were talking about the efforts that they were working on. It is such a global issue, a national issue, a state issue, a local issue. So um, it's a, it was a really excellent presentation if anybody wants to go back and, and check that out. And of course, they had many family members in the audience sharing their experiences as well. Um, Representative Tabke. Thank you, Chair Moeller. Um, I had two quick questions. Is uh, One, um, you're talking about the uh, the amount of fentanyl in pills and different like, kinds of things have increased and significantly from last year to this year. What do we account for that? Like why that doesn't make any sense to me from like a, uh, economic standpoint as to how this all works. Like how, what do we attribute the increase in fentanyl and pills to? Um, Mr. Mayor, Madam Chair and Representative Tabke, I think it's, I mean, the thing about these fentanyl pills is it's not, scary like you don't have to inject it. It's nothing that smoked. It comes in a pill form. It's easy for individuals to sell it, right? It's no longer large quantities come in and you have to break it up and you have to cut it with other drugs and then bag it up. The pills come in, you can sell them one, five, ten at a time, and it's really simple to do that. I would also think that with this younger generation, social media is another way that these pills are being sold and these conversations are happening. I mean, it's a different kind of drug. They're made differently and the communication methods are all light years ahead of what they used to be. So I think it's a combination of all those factors together. Um, and that's why it's such a multi-pronged faceted in our response to it, right? We have to kind of an all hands on deck, all options are on the table to deal with it. So. Thank you. Anything else? And then uh, second question, and I'm not sure if uh, you guys can answer this or not, but one of the earlier testifiers had uh, mentioned that Narcan was becoming less effective on helping. Does, is that, uh, I hadn't heard that before. Is that uh, something that's becoming a significant problem or what is the reasoning behind that? If you guys can answer that or I don't know if there's a pre previous testifier that could help with that as well. Well, yes. Mr. Meyer. Madam Chair and Representative Tabke, I can take a quick swing at it. Um, I think it depends on how potent the fentanyl is as well, right? Like you could have the pure fentanyl, but then when it comes in in powder form, it can be cut with different things to expand the amount that they have. So you could have reports of, you know, I had to use Narcan one time, but the dose of fentanyl that that individual user got wasn't as potent as another one. For the committee, an example that we use in the narcotics world to kind of explain it and it's it's simple but if you think about making like a chocolate chip cookie recipe you put everything together and then you sprinkle the chocolate chips in 
Well, that's what happens when they press these pills or they take cocaine or whatever and cut it with fentanyl and other things because the fentanyl gets sprinkled in and then you can scoop out and have 24 uni uniform cookies on a cookie sheet and bake them, but you have no idea on the inside of that cookie which one has two chocolate chips and which one has eight chocolate chips. Well, the eight chocolate chip cookie is the fatal one. And if you have a thousand of them in a bag, you have no idea which one it is. So that's another reason why it's so dangerous right now. As you can't tell, it's not controlled and it's all over the board. Thank you. All right. Any further member discussion? Representative Navani. Thank you, Chair Muller. And uh, I'd just like to say uh, the other night, Representative Holland talked about the bill that she didn't get done that haunts her. This is the bill that I carried last year that haunts me, that I didn't get done. And I was uh, relieved to not have the pressure on me to get it done this year and honored Representative Baker that you would take it over. Um, you've got the tenacity and the drive and the relationships to get it done. So thank you. Thank you for starting the task force. Thank you, Chair Moeller, for getting up in the early mornings and doing these and being, being able to work and juggle the concerns of both sides and taking uh, input. So with that, um, thank you, everyone that was on the task force, and I'm for this. Any closing remarks, Representative Baker? Madam Chair, I think, and members, um, thank you all for your help and your listening. I know we are running short of time. Um, I just, I, I, again, I want to say that uh, we are doing so many things in the state to help people stay alive. Their treatment centers are doing better and getting more aware of this and getting people into treatment when they need it. And withdrawal management is important when you're dealing with withdrawal from heroin and, and from uh, opioids. Um, I am so proud of the team that's put this together. Um, this deals with sale and possession in a level that we need to get on right away. There's also some tweaks to third degree. Again, as uh, Representative Becker Finn mentioned, we've got the mandatory carry. In other bills, we're also making sure the director or the uh, board of pharmacy is recognizing the, the, the languages of fentanyl and the different versions of that that's coming. The de definitions of fentanyl is important. And we've got other bills that we're working through with you know, Narcan in the schools. We are just part of the whole picture. Thank you for all of this this morning. Uh, it's important that we continue this journey for the families, the hundreds of families. Again, what you're looking at in these, in these pamphlets here, that's two weeks in Minnesota of the people that are dying in Minnesota. 48 people died. We average lose about three to four every single day in Minnesota. So think about that. And just your work here today is important. I can't wait to get this in the hands of the Senate. They're kind of waiting for the right language, and this is the right language. So I'm very excited to get this in. And again, Madam Chair, I cannot thank you enough for your bipartisan work on this. Happy to do whatever we have to do to get this done. So thank you, members. Thank you, and thanks for the discussion, and again, to all the testifiers who are here today. And with that, I renew my motion and lay over House File 615 as amended. The next bill we're going to hear is House File 2041. It's a Chair Gomez bill. I will move to lay over House File 2041. Um, Chair Gomez, welcome to the committee. Please introduce, not introduce yourself. I'm so used to that. We all know who you are. <laughs> but welcome to our committee. And I don't see any amendments, so please tell us about your bill. Great. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, members of the committee, for hearing this bill. Um, <clears throat> so House File 2041, it, it does two things, one of which is sort of more related to public health. Um, so that, that's kind of sections two, three, four. Um, but what is of concern, I think, to, to the jurisdiction of this committee is um, that House File 2041 repeals section 152.092, um, which is the um, possession of drug paraphernalia crime. And so this bill kind of on the whole is really about um, harm reduction. And for those of us who uh, have been unfortunate enough to have a loved one who, especially who's addicted to an opiate that they're injecting, um, you know, what we want to do for our loved ones in that situation is keep them alive long enough that they'll be able to get help. Um, and so, you know, I think that in our country and certainly in this legislature, there has been a genesis or a, a kind of a transformation around the way that we 
relate to people who are impacted by substance use disorder. Um, like the war on drugs has been a failure and criminalizing people who are, you know, have a substance use disorder doesn't help. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help their families. It doesn't help our communities. Um, so, you know, somebody who is in possession of drug paraphernalia on the street in an interaction with law enforcement is most likely somebody who has an addiction, is in the throes of it. By criminalizing, you know, criminalizing drug paraphernalia doesn't help us to do anything about the kind of drug trade, the supply, where it's moving. It doesn't help us bust dealers. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't do any of those things. What it does is, you know, criminalize people who are, who need um, public health interventions, who need treatment interventions. Um, and, you know, we know, you guys all know, because I'm sure that you discuss frequently the collateral consequences of criminalization. And, you know, um, we have to ask ourselves if like, I mean, this is, you know, possessing a, uh, a, a drug paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia is not a felony, I think it's like a gross misdemeanor, petty misdemeanor. Um, but it, but it does sort of um, create a pretext for more contact with law enforcement for further criminalization of people who really need, as I said, that public health intervention. Um, so that's what the bill does. I do want to mention, just because I have had some learning myself about this, um, you know, I, I think there was a question in the last committee, actually in, a pub, in the health committee, um, well, you know, like, we already exempt... Um, syringes from from the definition of drug paraphernalia, um, but you know, people. I have an active um, harm reduction uh, kind of operation in my district, Southside Harm Reduction Services, who uh, you know distribute safe use supplies on the street to people who are using. Um, and and they told me about you know kind of that. <clears throat> um, like if somebody is injecting meth or heroin or cocaine, that's the most dangerous way to administer the drug. It's the most likely to lead to overdose. It's the most likely to lead to um, health impacts. And so when somebody who's, who is in addiction makes the choice that they wanna, for example, maybe they wanna smoke their crack or their meth or their heroin rather than injecting it, and then they're, they're in possession of a, a pipe, right? And harm reduction workers would be in possession of these smoking supplies. That the harm reduction worker is actually then committing a crime even though they're trying to help this person engage in less risky behavior so that they can stay alive long enough to get the help that they need. Um, the, the individual person who's addicted, who is trying, you know, who is not in possession of syringes, right, which are exempted from this law and is instead in possession of a smoking device is who's making a choice to, to do something that is potentially less harmful to them um, under our current law would be committing a crime. So, so that's what the bill does. Um, the intent really here is just, you know, to try to, to actually in, do, uh, to approach people who are impacted by substance use disorder from an evidence-based public health lens. And so I think this is a small thing that we can do to move further in that direction. And I appreciate your consideration, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. And I think you have, uh, there's one testifier, Eddie um, Krompotich. Yeah. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Please introduce yourself when you get to the table and then you can begin your testimony. Hi, everybody. My name is Edward Browning Krumpetich. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's wonderful to be here to testify on behalf of such an amazing bill. Uh, like was said, my name is uh, Edward Krumpetich. I lead a harm reduction collaborative and coalition in the state of Minnesota, which includes over 40 public and private health organizations, community nonprofits, and people with lived experience from substance use and substance use disorder. This bill has been personally crafted by those of us who treat serve, and live with the disease of addiction. As the Upper Midwest Policy Lead with the National Harm Reduction Coalition, I have expertise in substance use and harm reduction related policies and interventions. 
I also serve the Minnesota community as a suicide de-escalator for First Call 211 in the National Suicide Prevention Line in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And I'm in long-term recovery from severe methamphetamine use disorder, HIV, Hep C, and chronic mental health conditions. Per the Minnesota Department of Health, Hep C numbers have steadily increased since 2012. Overdose rates for opioids have hit record numbers in the past decade, and treatment admissions have stayed relatively flat here in the state of Minnesota. Why are people dying, getting disease, and not seeking help? Those numbers do not lie. We have created a system whose, men whose mentality is to not treat sick people, but to incarcerate them. They fear, like myself, you can go to Itasca County. I serve as the chair of the Human Rights Commission in Itasca County, Minnesota, where my, uh, where my jail photo sits for a fifth degree possession of methamphetamine. They fear the loss of freedom, like I did, even more than the loss of my life. HF2041 would remove the criminality behind drug paraphernalia. The goal of this provision is to provide access for those who use, substance, uh, as who, those who use substances to services like syringe service providers, pharmacies, and other health systems. Ironically, these services currently distribute illegal paraphernalia, as the representative said. For example, Southside Harm Reduction dis uh, dispenses smoking supplies, syringes, those frontline workers, just like our hospital workers who are on the front lines, are distributing illegal paraphernalia on our streets. That's like asking a doctor who does that, who dispenses a syringe, that they're dispensing illegal drugs. This law would decriminalize both the system, the participant, removing structural, systemic, and sociological barriers that impede sustained progress in Minnesota recovery efforts. Decades of empirical evidence from around the world show that reducing and eliminating criminal penalties for paraphernalia and possession do not increase drug use or crimes. Uh, they lower addiction, overdose, HIV, AIDS, and lowers the cost burdens associated with our criminal justice system. Many people who need drug treatment or medical assistance avoid seeking the help for fear of incarceration, so they tend to hide their drug use and share paraphernalia, increase overdose and infectious diseases. I was one of those cases. I got HIV and Hep C from a dirty syringe without access to an SSP. We want them to feel safe and empowered to visit our Minnesota centers where these entities can become the first points of contact rather than a jail cell. Removing paraphernalia criminality reduces the stigma and fear between those of us who want to help and treat a substance user, including our law enforcement communities. We have handicapped the discretion of our law enforcement officers who must, by law, defer individuals into prison rather than treatment. Our communities of color, indigenous communities, LGBTQIA plus communities, socioeconomically disadvantaged persons in townships are disproportionately affected by this epidemic. These communities deserve better than what we are, have provided and are currently giving them. HF uh, 2041 takes us a step in the right direction. I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you. We'll move on to member discussion. Representative Hollins. Thank you, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Gomez. I, it's this is less of a question and, and more of story time. But I'll be quick, I promise. Um, I had an uncle who, uh, in his younger years, in college, got involved in drug use and heroin, and contracted hepatitis C from using a dirty needle. Um, he got clean with the help of his family. He got treatment and he became a fully functioning member of society, like a lot of folks do. Um, he got a job, he worked as a social worker, he had a wife and kids, um, but that hepatitis C was with him for the rest of his life. And five years ago, he died from complications of cirrhosis of the liver and he left a 15-year-old daughter who now has to live without her father because 
of the stigma and the systems that we have in place that say it's more important for us to punish addicts than it is for us to provide for them. And he didn't deserve to have to live with that for the rest of his life. He didn't deserve to be punished forever because of a mistake that he made when he was 21 years old. And his daughter doesn't deserve to have to deal with that punishment as well. And she has to live for the rest of her life without her dad. So I am wholly in support of this. I think it's an important aspect of moving away from a punitive way of thinking about these things and really moving towards a system of thinking about this as a mental health issue and helping the people who are involved in this so they can become fully functioning members of our society. So thank you. Thank you. Further member discussion? Um, Representative Grassel. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you know, I'd like uh, I'd like all of us to take just to take a step back, and you know, I there's been a lot of talk about law enforcement doing this or that, but I just encourage people: do not blame your law enforcement officers for enforcing laws that the legislature puts on them to enforce. Testifier alluded to that that their hands are tied. That's what they have to do. That's the guidelines that they're given to work within. Having worked in, in narcotics for six years, violent crimes for six years, and seeing the devastation that narcotics brings to people and their families, watching little kids fight, fight a dog for food on a dish that their diaper hasn't been changed for how long. That's what your law enforcement officers see out there sometimes when they're dealing with, these, with, with the narcotics trafficking. They want to help people. But what we put on them as legislators, we put that burden on their shoulders to, to have to enforce these laws. Narcotics trafficking, the fight against that, this war on drugs, is not solely a law enforcement officer's job. It's an all hands on deck. And the previous bill that we just heard tells us that, shows us that. And I thank you for getting that on, getting that on the agenda to get heard, Madam Chair. And I guess I, I look at this and I want to help the, those people that, and it's been years that your law enforcement community has said, some of these crimes, these lower level offenses, those are the people that need the help. They're not the dealers. The dealers and the traffickers were the people that I went after. Those were the search warrants that I wrote, the investigations that I did. And you can ask anybody who, who has worked in the narcotics field, these people that are on the lower levels, those are the ones that are, that are reeling from the suffering from it, the addictions. They need help. But you gotta, you gotta give them the tools, gotta give law enforcement the tools to do the job, to go after the dealers, to go after the traffickers, and to knock this crap out. So I guess, you know, I look at, I know you're, you got, you, your heart's in the right place, but you know, I look at uh, this uh, needle distribution, I guess, can't local health authorities already ensure safe distribution of, of syringes or, or places for people facing addiction to use safely? And uh, I guess, uh, what problem would this be solving, this, this piece of legislation? And that's for the author. Yep, Madam Chair. Chair Gomez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Grossel. I think that it sounds like we agree on a lot of this. Um, and, you know, I, and I appreciate the perspective about, um, you know, law enforcement needing to focus their resources and time on trafficking on those sort of higher level um, things that are, that are really contributing to the, the suffering that those who are in active addiction experience. Um, you know, the reason, that was why I brought up kind of the example about um, safer smoking supplies, and my testifier alluded to it also. Um, you know, the reason that we're, that I'm proposing getting rid of the drug paraphernalia crime altogether is because people who are walking around with drug paraphernalia in their pockets are people who are in active addiction. And criminalizing them has, sh has proven um, to not be a public policy that actually solves the issue, the issues that are facing our communities. 
And so specifically, I mean, that's, I don't know if, if, the, if the example about, about, you know, somebody who is in active addiction making the choice to move from injecting drugs, which as we said, right, is the, is the most kind of dangerous, high impact way that you can ingest drugs, to smoking, like somebody's making that decision, and, and there are organizations that are helping people in addiction make that decision. Because one of the things about these, you know, these syringe service providers, these harm reduction frontline medical workers who are out, I mean, they're in the streets, they're in encampments. We have had um, the Minnesota Department of Health um, has been tracking and, uh, you know, kind of the first big HIV outbreak that we've seen in Minnesota that you can kind of like track to, to and, it's, and it's in encampments among unsheltered people. Um, and there are a couple, there, were, there was, I believe, there's one in Duluth and one in the Twin Cities, and the one in the Twin Cities is over 100 people. The one in Duluth is around 65 to 75 people that they tracked who contracted um, HIV. And, you know, so, so that is a, is, a, is a dangerous way of, of ingesting a drug. And we have made the, we have, we have um, eliminated that from the definition of drug paraphernalia. So if we've eliminated what is the highest impact, most potentially dangerous way of ingesting a drug, and then we're still criminalizing the supplies that people might use to make a decision to move toward, you know, less harm. Um, I, I just don't think that makes sense. Um, you know, the other thing that I just want to mention about, and I'm sure you know this, right, about these syringe service providers, about needle exchanges, about harm reduction organizations, is that it's not just like about, um, you know, uh, enabling people's behavior. It's that when, when, when someone who's in active addiction, especially someone who's on the street, like these, like Southside Harm Reduction Services uh, serves, it's like you're creating a relationship with a medical professional. And if, if you've known anybody who's been trying to get off opiates, it's like sometimes there's just like a moment when it's the moment. And you have to, you have to get it done in that moment because give it six hours and, it, and they, their, their mind might be changed. And so in that moment, when someone who is in active addiction is ready, then they need to have somebody to call. And like these frontline medical workers, these harm reduction workers are a lot of times that person. Um, when, you know, they might not have, you know, almost everybody who's living on the street has had like a terrible abusive interaction with the medical system almost without fail. Um, so, you know, I, I didn't want to go too, I'm sorry, I went a little far afield, but, but just, just to say that, that like this is an effort to, to reduce harm, to have a less punitive, more, um, more humanitarian reaction to people who are in active substance use disorder. And, and the, the, you know, exempting syringes and having this other stuff on the books is a crime. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So. Thank you. And um, in the interest of time, we've got three members on the list. So we're going to uh, move to, to through those questions now. Representative Ingen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, you know, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago if I could support something like this, I would have said no. But then I actually engaged in a lot of discussions with particularly my, my cousin, uh, she's a nurse in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and she sh told me some stories about folks who were given the opportunity to have that help when they, when they really didn't have it before. Um, and one thing that I'm just curious about, I, I want to know, are these service providers who distribute those syringes, are they bound to both educating and distributing, or can they just distribute and use tax dollars to do so? Because I, I don't want this to incentivize um, organizations to feel as if they can they can pop up and a ask for these grants or however we're going to be administering this and um, in the future for uh, service providers and just simply hand them out without having that education piece alongside it, if that makes sense. So could you speak a little bit to that and to some of the provisions around that? I'm not sure if it's for you or your testifier. Yeah, it might be for my testifier. All right, so Mr. More about SSPs than I do. Yeah, so it's a, that's a complicated question. But to, to your point, 99% of the syringe service providers in the United States are comprehensive mental health and substance use programs, which that means that they include referrals to treatment. To your question earlier, and I wanted to answer this, if somebody visits a syringe service provider like Harm Reduction Sisters or Southside, you are five times more likely to enter a treatment center than not. Five times more likely. Pharmacists in rural Minnesota, for example, are already dispensing syringes um, 
to those people who are affected with substance use disorder because that is the public health initiative that must take place in rural Minnesota in order to save lives. Those individuals currently lower infection rates in places like Itasca County where I live by 50%. So whether this is a criminal justice issue or whether this is a public health issue, however you choose to view it, you are lowering infection rates by 50%. So this HIV outbreak that we have here in Duluth, for example, was a, could have a 50% reduction uh, in uh, HIV if we would have implemented these programs sooner. Um, to your point also, so when we enact a bill like this, these services are already enacted. So when somebody starts up a syringe service provider, it is a comprehensive program, which means people are coming to a program where they are going to see a form of recovery. Right, that is the goal here. However, if, to your question, if you look at a pharmacist who is dispensing syringes, that's not a comprehensive program to, a, to, a, to its definition, right? So somebody can already come to a pharmacist and get syringes as it is. Thank you. Uh, next on the list, we have Representative Curran. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just wanted to point out, um, there's been a lot of discussion where we're talking about, you know, is this a criminal justice issue? Is this a public health issue? Is this a mental health issue? Is this a poverty issue? It's all of these things. It's all of these things together. And um, I'm, what I just really wanted to point out is that, um, you know, we just, we just heard House File 615 um, to, to look at it from the criminal perspective um, and try to attack it from that angle because that is a piece of it. Um, but you're right, uh, this, this absolutely is a public health issue as well. And so this isn't necessarily an either or, this is a this and. Um, we're looking at a lot of things, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to um, make sure that we're not criminalizing homelessness. And then we're providing the resources so that people can get out of homelessness. Um, and that's a serious issue that we can all get behind. And I see this issue as the same. Um, we can deal with crimes when it's somebody who's committing a crime and doing things that um, that affect others in a negative way, like dealing drugs that kill people. That's a serious issue that we come at, at from a criminal angle. Um, but when we have people who are um, who are vulnerable um, to those dealers um, and end up with access to drugs and fall further into addiction, uh, the way to help that person is not to put them uh, in the criminal justice system. Um, and we've talked too about strengthening the men mental health services for those folks who are incarcerated. And so to continue to incarcerate people who are already dealing with mental health issues um, goes exactly against some of the work that we're trying to accomplish. And so I think this piece of legislation, this is something that I've been behind for several years. I know other countries have been doing this for quite a while and it's very successful. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see you bringing this here today and I just really wanted to point out that um, a multifaceted, multifaceted approach is absolutely the way to do this um, and we don't have to make choices of which one is better. Um, Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, fantastic discussion. Very, and these materials are great. I encourage people to go online and take a look at them to get educated about it. I just wanted to um, highlight for members, um, with, there's this recurring conversation that we have about where the function of being punitive should fit into the work that we're doing. Um, and just to, to clarify at least where I'm coming from in that conversation, uh, I don't think it applies here, being punitive. I think the case has been made very well um, that if, if the objective here is to make people's lives better and to make our community safer, um, punishing users and making it more difficult for them to access the help that they need to make their lives better is not the way to go. Um, the debates that we have in other areas um, regarding the punitive function of criminal justice, um, the, where I'm coming from on that is if you harm somebody, if you have a victim that you've harmed, then you should have to pay a price for that. But in this case, we're dealing with people who, as has been well stated, are dealing with uh, a health issue, mental health issue, physical health issue. Um, and they're, if they're victimizing anyone, it's themselves. And so we need to help them. So thank you. Uh, Representative Navani. Thank you, Chair Muller. <clears throat> Representative Gomez, you, you talked about the moment. They have the moment that they decide when they hit rock bottom. And I would submit that many, many times, a good majority of the times, the rock bottom is 
when they have a, an encounter that with law enforcement that causes them to have to answer for their their actions and yes 99% of the time caused by a sub substance use disorder we're gonna hear bills later um, I see they're on the schedule for record expungement and I'll be the first one to stand up and say um, if we're gonna we should do record expungement for substance substance use disorder related crimes but we're also going to have bills talking about technical violations that shouldn't get you brought back into the system. That is the moment for many people that saves their lives. And I know that. Several people at the table here can tell you uh, conversations at Menards or the grocery store from people that we were their low moment. We were that rock bottom that caused them to make a decision to change your life. You're taking away that ability to give them a relief valve. The part of the bill that says we want to protect workers so they're not uh, charged for possession of um, <clears throat> drug paraphernalia when they're distributing the needles, to me is like blaming, you know, uh, we have to make a law that we have to change the burglary possession tools because somebody at Home Depot might sell a bolt cutter. I don't see the connection. Show me a case where somebody from one of these health organizations has ever been charged for needle possession and I'll, I'll make a donation to their cause. But uh, I think it's ill-advised. I think this is the, you're, you're eliminating a chance for people to get the help that they could get. Thank you, Chair. And uh, because you were the last one to talk, I'll let you um, cover that in your closing comments, Chair Gomez. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, really appreciate the discussion today. Um, I just want to note that this did um, pass out of the uh, Health Committee with bipartisan support. This is not a partisan issue. Um, Representative Novotny, you're absolutely right. I have loved ones in my life who the thing that's gotten them to get the help that they need is landing in jail. Um, but this is, you know, it's a, it, possessing drug paraphernalia is a petty misdemeanor. Um, that's not going to get anybody, and, uh, and uh, that's not going to land anybody in jail, most likely. Maybe it will for a minute, but, uh, you know, that's, this, this is not like sort of those, those consequences that, um, for possession or distribution, and a lot of times I do just want to say, you know, I mean, somebody who's, you know, has a few grams of a serious substance that they're selling, they're pro a lot of times those folks are also um, themselves addicted. And so, you know, I, I would just say, like, that unfortunately, a lot of people who are, you know, who are in active addiction, they are, they're engaging in a lot of illegal activity. Um, I, I guess I just don't see the wisdom of, of you know, making the possession of drug paraphernalia illegal. I don't see how that contributes to helping somebody get help. Um, it doesn't, it does not help us um, interrupt trafficking. It does not help us interrupt even low level distribution. It actually doesn't even impact, um, you know, the criminalization of possession of small amounts of substances, which still remains in Minnesota an incredibly like a fifth degree felony, right, for less than a gram of heroin. I mean, it's, we have incredibly strict possess drug possession laws in Minnesota. So if you're worried about there not being enough opportunities for people who are, you know, in active substance use disorder to be criminalized and then get the opportunity to go to jail to get the treatment they need, I don't think that that's a problem in Minnesota. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's just getting rid of a relatively uh, kind of, you know, a small piece of the um, constellation of things that, that people, unfortunately, you know, because of criminalization, have to do, do to get drugs and, um, you know, doesn't touch possession, distribution, trafficking, anything. So um, with that, I just uh, really do genuinely want to thank uh, this committee for the thoughtful conversation. I'm hopeful that um, you'll consider putting this in the omnibus bill, and I hope that regardless of party that we can um, just affirm, you know, that 
moving from a punitive approach to substance use disorder to an evidence-based, compassionate uh, public health approach to substance use disorder is to, all to the good for our communities, period, point blank. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll renew my motion and lay over House File 2041. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we're going to move things on the agenda. We're going to move to Representative Pinto's bill or Chair Pinto's bill, House File 2294. I will move to lay over House File 2294. Chair Pinto has a DE3 amendment. Chair Pinto, would you like to move your uh, amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to do so, and, and it maybe deserves just a, just a second of explanation, um, which is just that uh, the bill as introduced uh, resembled the bill that passed last year uh, establishing a, a task force of the statewide response to substance abuse. And uh, for reasons I'll maybe get into um, further, the, um, the DE3 changes that to uh, report uh, to address these issues. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just note that um, that uh, want to make sure that we're receiving some really innovative ideas, reasons that we'll talk about. Um, but it seemed to me that that having a report to do that would make more sense than having a task force, and uh, and would love to have members' support to continue the discussion. All right, I, all those in favor of the DE three amendment, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion prevails. The DE three amendment is adopted. All right, now you can go ahead and tell us about your bill as amended, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and members, I'm really uh, excited about this, uh, especially in connection with the conversations that we've been having this morning. Um, I think uh, it can, it's been said several times in this room this morning, and I think um, could be said by anybody looking at the situation fairly, that uh, our current approach uh, to uh, illicit drugs uh, is uh, still leading to many, many Minnesotans and many Americans losing their lives um, to extensive addiction, to many, many problems. We want to make sure that we're having the absolute most effective approach to this, um, to discourage this, this pandemic, as was referred to before, that we possibly can. Um, uh, what I wanted to do is to have, and um, what the bill proposes to do, is to have us step back and say, what are the very best approaches being used around the country, around the world, when it comes to uh, illicit, dr illicit drug use? Um, what are the best approaches that Minnesota can use? Um, we've prided ourselves as a state um, in being nation leading and world leading in all kinds of areas when it comes to the, the wellness um, of our residents and the approaches we take to public policy problems, and this should be no exception. So what the proposal does is um, it uh, appropriates funds uh, to, uh, to have a report. Um, Rise Research LLC is the, is the organization. Um, I should note that, uh, that the thing was we want to get going on this um, right away so that we can have some good um, recommendations to act upon by even the 2024 session, and so we'll need to move quickly. Um, you'll be able to see in the bill language that the report um, will review approaches taken other jurisdictions, as I said, and a number of other things. Um, and what we want to do is, is get that information um, back, and then we will be in the driver's seat to decide what to do with it. I think it makes sense, Madam Chair, if, if I can have my testifier come up and provide some background. This is one of the researchers who I would expect would be participating in the, in the work. Thank you. So the researcher is Ariel Edelman McHenry. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ariel Edelman McHenry. I'm a drug policy and public health subject matter expert. Um, like Representative Pino said, it's time to take a clear-eyed, holistic look at Minnesota's current policies on drugs. In the last couple of years, those policies have netted the following results. The number of people dying of an opioid overdose annually in our state has doubled since 2019 as more toxic adulterants contaminate the drug supply. MDH has declared HIV outbreaks in Hennepin, Ramsey, and St. Louis counties associated with injection drug use. And from 2017 to 2021, one in three deaths among people experiencing homelessness was caused by substance use, especially opioids caught with fentanyl. I hope we can agree. Our current drug policy scheme is not keeping Minnesotans safe or healthy. My colleague, Dr. Ann Siegler, and I together have 25 years of experience working at the intersection of drug policy, public health, and criminal legal system reform. Dr. Siegler, an expert epidemiologist and evaluator, has led evaluations and new initiatives related to syringe access, overdose, and documenting the health impacts of incarceration on Rikers Island. In my own consulting practice, I've reported on the ways community corrections departments across the country are integrating overdose prevention into their policies and practices and documented country-level policy changes that eased barriers to drug treatment during COVID-19. Dr. Siegler and I will bring the same rigor and experience to the proposed project. We plan to research and write a report that will provide a comprehensive review of Minnesota's drug policy, 
examine how other states and countries are testing new approaches to drug policy to maximize health and safety outcomes for their residents, and offer recommendations for Minnesota to do the same. RISE Research will be the entity receiving the funds, and Dr. Siegler and I will be the primary researchers. Minnesotans deserve effective, evidence-based drug policies that allow everyone to live healthy, safe lives. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. We didn't have anybody from the public sign up to testify, so we will move on to member discussion. Um, Representative Feist, Vice Chair Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Pinto, for bringing this bill. Um, I love evidence-based practices, and I think this is an area, obviously, as we've heard from our testimony today on other bills, this is so incredibly important, and I think we need to follow research and data um, to make sure we get this right. Um, I think when we're trying to balance um, a criminal justice response and a public health response, I think um, we need to follow the data. And I was just looking at one report, looking at fentanyl in particular, saying that harm reduction measures, such as Representative Gomez's, um, are, are very likely to be more effective than punitive measures. Um, stronger Good Samaritan laws, increased access to Narcan, distribution of test strips that indicate the presence of fentanyl and black market drugs, legalization of supervised drug consumption sites, and expansion of treatment using substitute opioids, including research on injectable alternatives. So there are just so many ways that we can approach these issues, and, and we want to be research-based in, in doing them. So I think this is incredibly important, and I thank you for bringing it. Further member discussion? Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Pinto, uh, can you expound upon um, why the shift uh, from your original bill to the DE, what were what factored into the decision to move away from a task force model to um, contracting with a outside group to create a report? Chair Pinto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thanks, Representative Hudson, for the question. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, it seemed to me that what we need is a you know, broad approach, one looking all over, as I said, the country and the world, and some willingness to be um, be innovative and to kind of give us back a bold vision. And the concern that I had um, was that a task force, it seems like, is particularly well suited to particular kinds of public policy problems. Um, but as I thought about sort of what we would be likely to get back from a task force, if you've got a particular narrow issue, that's one thing. But in this, um, and I guess I, I'm just thinking even practically, like at, at best if somebody spends 10% of their, of their work day, because of course the people on the task force, all the whole point is that they have other things that they're doing. Um, are they really going to have the time, the vision, all of it to be able to put in what they need to to give us back something that, remember, whatever we get back then has to make it through all sorts of additional steps of the process. So I kind of do want something that is, um, that there's a willingness to be somewhat bold and to draw upon sort of the best, which a task force can do. I think if you had a multi, multiple years, um, uh, so I, I will say there's a bit of a balance to strike, maybe anticipating yours or somebody else's question. I was thinking about this coming in today that, um, and I've spoken with, with um, Ms. McHenry about this, um, you know, the uh, bookshelves here in the legislature are packed with reports that come back to the legislature and nothing happens with them. And my own bookshelf has, and has a number of those, right? So we've talked about the fact that the value of this report is going to depend on its credibility. And the credibility is going to depend on sort of how willing are the researchers to, to look at a wide set of uh, possibilities and uh, how much, uh, how well is it that we can be confident that in fact we can implement the recommendations. So it may well be that there's sort of a task force that ends up being connected with what comes out of the report, but it just seemed to me at this moment in time for what we're trying to do, um, what we need is to have some folks with deep expertise working full time, diving in and getting this done. There's a longer answer, but hopefully it gives you a sense as to kind of what the thinking is. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Pinto, for um, that answer. And I think I'm with you in terms of um, it being a more effective methodology to have folks who are diving in, taking a deep dive, and it's their sole focus as opposed to being split amongst um, other duties. <coughs> to the piece regarding credibility, I, th I think it would, in the interest of ensuring that whatever report comes back is viewed as credible, uh, my question for Ms. McHenry would be, where else can people look um, to examples of the work uh, that you've done um, to get a sense of the type of quality we can expect when we get this report? Ms. McHenry. 
Sure. Um, yeah, the, you can read the report that I've mentioned in my testimony about community corrections and overdose prevention that's posted on the, on the website of the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. So this is an organization that um, supports community-based mental health centers all across the country. It's a CDC-funded grant. Um, I spoke to well, I didn't speak to others. Con others conducted the key informant interviews, but I did the analysis and the reporting. Did a very broad literature review about really like fantastic evidence evidence based processes that counties all across this country are implementing to work on overdose um, with the support of law enforcement, community corrections officers, because the people that are coming into their offices um, are experiencing overdose and addiction issues, and like we're talking about here. Community corrections officers, really, the only tool in their toolbox is, is a punitive response. And, they, and that's not the only tool that they wish they had, right? Like, they wish that they had public health responses. So that's, maybe that will give you a sense of my work. Is that helpful? And, and I'll just say, too, like, if rather than trying to have you, like, list off all the things, <laughs> um, if you want to follow up, we are happy to share any reports or, you know, wherever or website to point to, whatever, with the committee and the members of the public so that we can um, take a look at your work. Yeah. Thank you. Further member discussion, Representative Hollins. You know, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Pinto. I guess not so much a question, but um, I'm just really grateful for you bringing this. I can't believe I didn't think about doing this earlier. I'm kind of embarrassed because I can't tell you how many times I've looked through research and been like, gosh, I really wish there was something specific that compiled all of this so we could make the best decisions possible when we're looking at policy. So I just want to thank you for bringing this forward because that's exactly what I've been looking for. I could have just done it. Uh, Representative Witte. Thanks, Chair Muller. Uh, thanks, uh, Representative Pinnell, for bringing this forward. Um, does this, uh, is this repetitive of what the governor's new council's doing? Chair Pinto. Thank you. Um, so no, I've actually been, I think if you're talking about, I think it's Jeremy Drucker is, uh, when you say the governor's new council, I should maybe just confirm the council that you're referring to, pardon me. Yeah. Representative Witte. Um, I thought he had a new subdirector that they were looking into um, the opioids and, and this issue in general. So that's why I was wondering if can they overlap each other? Um, I like the direct approach, but obviously the governor is going to have a report and do they conflict each other? Chair Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Representative Woody. Um, so no, I've been in good touch with um, with Mr. Drucker actually about this about this process. Um, I think he's up in he's up in northern Minnesota today. He was going to try to make it, but I think he's watching online, even possibly. So hello. Um, and uh, so no, this is not uh, not duplicative of that. I think it really it really reinforce they really reinforce one another. So yeah, thank you. All right. Any further member discussion? No closing comments, Representative. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. I really think this is um, this is exciting uh, for us. We want to have uh, good information that we can use uh, and good recommendations and bold recommendations for us to consider next year and beyond. And so, I'm eager for your support to make this happen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And uh, Ms. McHenry, do feel free to share us uh, share with us any materials later on. Good. All right. Um, and with that, I will renew my motion and lay over House File 2294 as amended. We're going to move back now, members, to a representative um, Bierman bill, House File 1665. And I'm going to turn the gavel over to Representative Feist. I have to step out for a minute. So, so hello, Representative Bierman. Um, the next morning. bill that we have on the agenda is House File 1665. Uh, this is Representative Bierman's bill. Um, welcome to the committee. Um, we will also be laying over this bill. Um, so I will move to lay over House File 1665. Um, and I understand that you have an author's amendment, the A1 amendment. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I do have an author's amendment, the A1, which simply adds seven more substances to the list before you. Great, thank you for the explanation. So I will move the A1 amendment um, and um, any discussion to the A1 amendment. Uh, seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Great, the A1 amendment is adopted. Um, Representative Bierman, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just uh, this, this bill comes to us from the Board of Pharmacy. It's simply a request of the legislature to make permanent the scheduling of the 39, or I should say now 46 substances that the DEA has already placed in Schedule 1 on, at the federal level. These, uh, 
These items are presently listed on Minnesota's Schedule 1, but it is only temporary and it needs to be confirmed by the legislature to make them permanent. So it is a public safety issue simply because if people are caught with possession or sale of these products and it is not on Minnesota's schedule, then they cannot be charged. So um, the other thing is that um, it is something that we have a little bit of uh, urgency for because it, the the placing them on the Minnesota schedule cannot be renewed, so we need to move forward this term. So I can answer any questions you have other than how to pronounce these drugs or spell them, <laughs> uh, but I'll do my best on everything else. Great, thank you so much for the explanation. Um, we have already taken public testimony on this bill, so we will move forward to member discussion. And it looks like we don't have any member discussion. You can pick up um, some time. So, yeah, we are running a bit behind, so that's not a bad thing. Um, any closing comments? Nope, just uh, thank you for your help on getting this done. It's an important issue, and uh, pleased to be here today and uh, to hear, the, hear about the work that you're doing on these other bills. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I will renew my motion and lay over House File 1665 as amended. Thank you. Where should we go next? Okay. Um, so the next bill that we have on the agenda is House File 2788, Representative Ekbadje. Let's see who's walking in the dark. Nope. Um, I believe I might be after that. Let me check my Who else do we have here? Who's here? Tapki. Thank you. Okay, we are moving ahead. House file 1600. Uh, Representative Tabke. I'm going to go grab my test fire, which is in the uh, hallway. Excellent. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that chair one is back. Okay, cool. Um, so we've moved ahead here. Okay, Esther's not here. So it's, this is All right, Representative Tabke, um, is your motion for House File 1600 to be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means? Yes, ma'am. And I don't see that you have any amendments, so your bill is before us. Please describe your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this is House File 1600, so it is a bill uh, to improve the pay, especially in the top end for state troopers. So in 2019, uh, 2020, we commissioned a study because troopers uh, in Minnesota were uh, vastly underpaid compared to their peers in uh, police departments and sheriff's departments and other uh, law enforcement throughout the state of Minnesota. And so losing folks every day, not being able to fill academies, and uh, the study was completed, and so it showed that uh, and then before that, sorry, uh, in 2020, we also did a pay raise for everyone in the conservation officer, uh, state trooper, that frame of uh, that bargaining unit. And so from there, um, we had a study completed and it showed where everyone sat on the uh, uh, wage ranges and benefits ra ranges. And from that point today, we are hoping to pull the troopers and c conservation officers out of the collective, out of the pattern bargaining unit and put them with their peers so that we're able to uh, pay uh, troopers appropriately so that we are able to maintain the number of troopers that we have as well as fill the academies and classes. And uh, Madam Chair, I have a uh, testifier. All right, great. And it looks like your testifier is uh, Mike Ledeau. You want to click your way to the testifier table and introduce yourself and begin your testimony, please. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Mike Ledoux. I've had the honor and privilege of being a state trooper for 29 years and I am the president of the Minnesota State Patrol Troopers Association. I would like to thank Representative Tapke for authoring House File 1600 and uh, would also like to thank the 20 co-authors as well. The purpose of this legislation is to provide a sound and comprehensive system for determining appropriate compensation for state troopers and other state law enforcement officers. In February of 2021, 
The Legislative Auditor's Office released a clear, concise, and objective report detailing the large wage disparity for state troopers when compared to the 34 city comparison group established by the legislature in 2020. The OLA report indicated that the top base wage that could be earned by state troopers in 2019 was substantially less than the top base wage available to police officers in most cities reviewed. The legislative intervention taken during the 2020 special session helped mitigate the disparity at starting wage, but a large disparity still exists at top wage. As a result of the market adjustment, the State Patrol moved from 33rd place on the list to 32nd. This disparity hurts career earnings, retirement benefits, and creates recruitment and retention issues. This wage disparity was created because of the practice of pattern settlement and five years without contractual increases from 2003 to 2012, which exacerbated the disparity. The practice of pattern settlement has done immeasurable harm to state law enforcement officers and their families for the majority of my career. Law enforcement officers have become free agents, turning lower paying departments into training departments instead of destination departments. The State Patrol has been forced to have two academies a year just to keep up with normal attrition because of insufficient qualified applicants. We have been unable to fill 63 positions funded by the legislature. House File 1600 strengthens the salary survey language of 299 do 3 and it provides much needed legislative oversight to assure that the wage disparity is limited, eliminated so we can continue to recruit, retain, and retire these dedicated public safety professionals. We have attempted to address this wage disparity for the last decade and we have been unsuccessful. Because we are essential employees, we lack the ability to strike. We cannot solve our wage disparity problem with the same thinking that created it. State troopers are not average, so I don't believe it's unreasonable for them to expect to be paid at or above the median wage of the comparison group established by the legislature. State law enforcement officers put service before self each day for the citizens of Minnesota. Please recognize their service by supporting House File 1600. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you, and uh, we did not have anybody sign up in advance to testify, so we'll move on to member discussion. Uh, Lead Novotny. Chair Moeller, thank you. Thank you, Representative Tab T, for bringing this forward. Thank you, uh, Trooper Ledoux, for being here. Uh, the, the, this kills me to say this after a man who uh, lost several good partners and good people to work with to the state patrol over the years and it always bugged me and I if I see them on the street I are uh, training or something I still give them a hard time for leaving us to go to the patrol and the hard part is now being in this position that I am I don't think the state patrol should ever be in a position to lose people to the county and that's where they're at now the flow is going the other way and it should never be that way and we need to make these changes. Um, the State Patrol should be the, they should be rewarded in compensatory ways that reflect their level of professionalism and I speak in favor of this bill. Thank you. All right, uh, closing comments. Mr. Representative Tapke. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair and uh, members. I'm uh, very pleased. Thank you very much to uh, Trooper Ledeau for all the work that he's been doing on this. We've got uh, really great bipartisan support for this bill, and I uh, hope to uh, move this forward and uh, write this so that we can make sure to be filling the academies and having the uh, state protection that we have. Uh, and Representative Tapke renews his motion that House File 1600 be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you. And thank you, Trooper Ledoux, for being here. All right, next up, we're going to do my bill. So we're going to switch over again here. I'll go to the testifier table. So 
the next bill on the agenda is House File 2034, uh, Chair Muller's bill, and uh, I will move to lay over House File 2034. Um, your bill is before us. There are no amendments filed on your bill, so please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. So we've done a lot of great work over the last several years. Um, dealing with sexual assault issues and thinking about um, victim survivors and getting justice for victim survivors. We've had a lot of bipartisan um, efforts that have gone, un, un, that have gone uh, through the last couple of years, um, including testing all rape kits, which was a representative O'Neill bill that, that we all signed on to. Um, and so I know that the BCA has worked very hard to get that up and running, um, and it's it's really good work that's happening in addition to some of the changing and rewriting of our sexual assault statutes to make sure that victim survivors get justice. Um, but one of the areas where they're not really getting justice right now, in spite of having the rape kit, the test all rape kits, is the length of time that it's taking um, to test those kits. And so what we're trying to do with this bill is really make sure that these kits um, are getting tested in a timely fashion. You'll see a number of letters in your packet about this. And I think for survivors that, um, that I've heard from about this, one of the things that's really stressful for them is knowing that they have you know, not only endured this traumatic event, but also um, going through the testing process, which is very difficult as well, um, knowing that their kit's been submitted and then they just see pending, 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 and they don't know what the results are gonna be of that test. They don't know if their offender is gonna be um, apprehended or identified as a result of that test, and they're waiting for justice. And so um, what we really wanna try to do is make sure that these kits get the highest priority um, and I do have a, a testifier, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you, um, Chair Moeller. And um, to our testifier, um, please uh, introduce yourself, um, your name and title for the record, and, and begin. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. My name is Artika Roller. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, MNCASA. MNCASA is a coalition that represents over 66 programs across the state of Minnesota. We provide support, technical assistance, and advocacy. Thank you for allowing me to speak today on the importance of a 90-day kit testing timeline for victims and survivors of sexual violence. The prompt testing of sexual assault kits is a survivor justice issue. When someone experiences a trauma such as sexual violence, they should receive care and support. They should not have to worry about whether or not their sexual assault evidentiary kit will be tested promptly and how the delay could affect their case. Over the past year, victims and survivors of sexual assault have waited up to eight months for kits to be tested without communication or status updates from forensic labs. The deprioritization of sexual assault kit testing is unacceptable and causes great harm for victims and survivors, their families, and for our community. Testing delays also can impede the criminal legal system, slowing down investigations, um, causing prosecutors to wait on critical evidence. This requires that victims and survivors spend even more time navigating a complex criminal legal system that often itself is re-traumatizing the victim. Historically, sexual assault kits have not been taken seriously as other forms of violent crimes. In Minnesota, we have seen this backlog of untested kits, victims and survivors not knowing what happened to their kits or their cases investigations not being conducted and people who have caused harm not being held accountable for the harm they have caused. Testing delays collaborates a larger society message that we do not take sexual violence seriously. Today, we have the opportunity to say something different. A 90-day timeline for testing sexual assault evidentiary kit is not only justice for victims and survivors, it's a reasonable standard. There is currently um, no time frame for laboratory testing of sexual assault kits. Um, law enforcement um, currently must pick up kits from hospitals. Um, within 10 days, law enforcement is also required to submit kits for laboratory testing within 60 days. Laboratories also should be expected to adhere to a reasonable timeline. Many states already have passed legislation mandating a time frame for sexual assault 
um, kit testing. It is also a best practice with our federal guidelines. It is time for Minnesota to um, join them. Victim and survivors of sexual assault in Minnesota deserve to have closure in a timely manner, complete forensic testing of their sexual assault kits by mandating a 90-day time frame. We declare that victims and survivors matter and people who cause harm will be held accountable. I urge you to vote today to ensure that victims of sexual assault receive the transparency and the accountability that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Chair Moeller and, and Director Roller. Um, we didn't have anyone sign up uh, to testify on our bill in advance, so we're going to move forward to member discussion. Representative Mueller. Uh, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and just sign on to the bill. Thank you so much for this bill. Um, I did have one question, though, on um, in the Senate, the, pa the bill passed to general orders and then was sent back to the committee. Just wanted to know what was going on with this and just to know that this is important and thank you for this. Yeah, I can never explain what the other body's doing, so I don't know what they're doing over there. Um, but one thing that is really important with this is also that we make sure we have the resources for the lab to be able to turn these around. And as you heard from Superintendent Evans in the presentation, that is part of the governor's request is for more funding for the laboratory. Um, we're also talking about changes that might need to be made to the language because one of the issues now is victims will see that pending notification. Um, but sometimes these kits move through different stages of testing and it just says pending the whole time and so we're trying to figure out is there a way to give maybe notification in a different way that sort of either sets out what the timeline is or tells them where in the stage of, of testing it is so we may do a little more language tweaking again so that's why we want to lay it over any other questions oh representative Hudson thank you madam chair um, chair Moeller I it's extremely disconcerting to think that um, this is something that's been deprioritized. Can you speak to that? Has there been uh, discussions of feedback with these laboratories that indicates why these extraordinary delays in testing have taken place? I mean, one would hope that this would be an extremely high priority item. Yeah, Superintendent Evans is here, so I'll have him address that. Please introduce yourself for the record and answer the question. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Chair Feist and uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the question, Representative Hudson. Uh, sexual violence is a violent crime, and the sexual assault kits that are being referred to today are part of the violent crime that is prioritized in our laboratory. As we had discussed yesterday, though, we've been under a fairly significant burden in the number of increases in cases that we've been experiencing. And we share the collective goal, as Minkasa has outlined as one of our very strong partners in Minnesota, that our victim survivors across Minnesota deserve to have their sexual assault examination kits tested in a very reasonable time frame. That's why in the governor's budget, we've proposed a 30-day goal. The kits are prioritized along with all other violent crime, but the increases we have been unable to keep up with, and that's led to the these extremely long lag times that are unacceptable both for us and obviously for all of our stakeholders and victim survivors across Minnesota. Thank you. And, and please say your name for the record. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> uh, the Vice Chair Feist. Uh, Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Thank you so much. Um, any follow-up? Uh, Lee Novotny. Thank you, Chair Feist. And uh, uh, <laughs> Superintendent Evans, just a quick question. Uh, technical question. So uh, other agencies in, or other laboratories in the state do DNA testing. Does the BCA do all of the same kits? Oh, uh, Superintendent Evans. Uh, Vice Chair Feist and uh, Representative Vasi members, there, we do not do all of the sexual assault examination kits in the state. Currently, there are two other laboratories that do DNA testing at the Hennepin County uh, Sheriff's Office and Noka County Sheriff's Office that represents three. I will note that as some of these bills have changed and we currently are the central repository for all uh, kits as they um, are received from the hospital, that we've seen an increase in the number of kits we do collectively as law enforcement is not required to use any particular lab, but those two other laboratories do this type of testing as well. Any follow-up? And Yeah, that is my follow-up question. Thank you, uh, Chair Feist and Superintendent Evans. So the, the database, can you just give, well, if it's an outside agency doing that DNA testing, how does that get 
updated and, and what do you need to make that current? Superintendent. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the current, so it, for any members that are, are not familiar, you passed a bill um, in the last couple of years that uh, implemented a, it's called Track It. It's a system that tracks the, the kits from the time they leave the BCA as we supply them for all uh, the state of Minnesota and then as it progresses to the hospital, to law enforcement, to the BCA. As uh, Chair Moeller noted that one of the things we're seeing is that there's a, uh, a pending notification um, that our victim survivors are seeing and we're currently examining the system to determine determine whether or not there's other ways. It's fairly new, we just rolled it out statewide, but to try to provide better information because I certainly um, uh, see the concern that that would raise if you just start logging in and seeing pending all the time. And so we are currently seeing, will the system allow that now and what processes and procedures we need to put in place to be able to populate that with meaningful information that would provide that information that uh, it certainly is deservedly uh, for them uh, as they're trying to see where it's at in the system. So to, to be clear, Representative Novotny, we don't quite know, but we're actively examining it. I've seen some back and forth from our laboratory personnel just this week as we've had uh, discussions with Mincasa how to improve that system to make sure we can meet that. I don't know if it'll be a modification that's required or if it's something we can do right now. Any follow-up? Th yes, I just wanted to make sure if there's something that you needed to help that, that, that team dressed and if, if we can help you in any way do that. Uh, that's what I was hoping for. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, um, Chair Moeller, any closing comments? Thanks for the discussion, and I look forward to your support. Thank you. So, members, um, thank you for the discussion. I will renew my motion and lay over House File 2034. Getting my steps in today. Uh, next up, we have House File 2788, a representative of Egbaje bill. And I will move that House File 2788 be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. I do see, Representative Egbaje, that you have an A1 amendment. I will move the A1 amendment. Would you like to um, explain your amendment, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The A1 amendment is mostly technical. Uh, amendment from the Department of Corrections, uh, changing some terminology over. I'm sorry, I'm having a lot of oh, trouble sorry. hearing you. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> Is Thank that better? You. Much microphones. Okay, sorry, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, yes, the A1 amendment is a technical amendment from the Department of Corrections, um, mostly using, uh, updating the terminology um, throughout the bill, and I believe, And if, if I can call Amy um, up to explain the last piece of it. We'll just vote on, why don't we just vote okay. on the amendment unless there's specific questions. Is, are there any questions about the amendment? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails and the A1 amendment is adopted. All right, Representative Gadjay, if you want to go ahead and explain your bill as amended. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. So this bill uh, primarily deals with the pardon process, which is an incredibly important executive function envisioned by the founders of this country and, and the state to recognize the importance of redemption and dignity of people who have turned their lives around and for whom justice requires another look at the long-lasting and far-reaching legal consequences of a criminal conviction. The bill centers equity, access, and inclusion. It addresses some real accessibility needs present in the current system and expands the pardon process to support, ensure, and to ensure full meaningful participation of all interested parties, including the victims. So this bill modifies the current pardon process in two primary ways. First, the bill responds to the state's Supreme Court 2021 decision that raised a constitutional question about unanimity in the board decision. The court opinion pushed the issues raised in that case to the legislature to address. And second, the bill creates a clemency review commission to support the board's work in reviewing applications. On the voting requirement in many states, and then on the voting requirement piece, you'll know that in many states, pardons are granted usually by the governor by themselves. And then other states may have a pardon board that uses a majority vote structure. 
But in Minnesota, our structure is quite unique in that we need a unanimous vote from the governor, the attorney general, and the chief justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court in order for a pardon to be granted. And so part of the Minnesota Supreme Court ruling really noted that while the current unanimous vote requirement is constitutional, the voting requirement is a question for the legislature. And the Supreme Court also made clear that a majority vote requirement, while consistent with most other pardon boards, could also be constitutional as long as the governor is in the majority. And so the bill puts that into place. So essentially, the bill makes clear that the governor plus one other member of the board can grant a pardon. And I'll let the commissioner speak mostly to the creation of the commission and, move, and, and how it's gonna move out of the correction space. But it is important to note that the workload of the pardon board currently falls to three of some of the busiest people in the state. Four of you include the commissioner of corrections as the board secretary. <clears throat> And importantly, this bill also helps put in safeguards and protections for victims who choose to engage in the process, which is something the current pardon framework has not been able to do. The bill is supported by a number of stakeholders, particularly victim coalitions and national clemency experts. You'll also see written testimony from Professor Mark Osler and letters of support from organizations, including the state's domestic violence and sexual assault coalitions in your packets. There's also a fiscal note for this bill, which shows that there's an expense of 986,000 each year, um, and that's also included in the governor's budget. And then with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move to testifiers. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner Schnell, welcome back to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of tw uh, House File 2788. <laughs> I, I am Paul Schnell, the Commissioner of Corrections. Uh, this is a bill uh, in an effort to improve an antiquated uh, but important process that was frankly not built for the modern day. At its core, this bill prioritizes needed supports and structure for full engagement in the uh, pardon process, making it accessible to more Minnesotans and providing enhanced capacity uh, for the three, some of the three busiest people in our state, the governor, chief justice, and attorney general. Um, I would note that the governor and uh, our agency stand in full support of this bill. In the last five years, petitions to the board have increased 325%. Put this in perspective, in 2022 alone, the board received 169 uh, petitions for pardon uh, or clemency, and we expect that number to a double given the increased interest in the pardon and commutation process. Currently, the Commissioner of Corrections uh, serves as the Secretary to the Board of Pardons, meaning that it is staff from the Department of Corrections who screen petitions, engage with applicants, and provide other administrative supports to the Board. This creates an odd dynamic in that the pardons process is distinct from the judicial and criminal justice system processes. It is a separate constitutional scheme that deserves and should have its own supports and structure outside the corrections system. I, have strong, I strongly believe that the Commissioner of Corrections should not have a direct role or serve as the secretary uh, and to this important and independent board. It therefore makes good procedural sense to remove the Department of Corrections in an official presence uh, in this process and create a commission with its own designated staff to provide the needed petition review, victim support, reporting, and recommendations to the Board of Pardons. The DOC will continue to support uh, the Board, the work for the first six months after passage, to get the Commission up and running, but at that point it would exist as a separate and independent entity, at which time the DOC would simply provide records to the Commission as needed. While the Commission makes recommendations to the Board for consideration, it is important to note that the Board maintains its full authority and discretion to grant or deny those petitions. And this is a model used in other states and not unique. I want to specifically speak to language access and uh, victim support services mentioned in this bill. The Department has come a long way in how it engages with victims in preparing for pardon petition reviews. But this bill rightly goes beyond simple codification of victim input and engagement requirement in that it provides for victim confidentiality when needed and establishes an expectation 
that supportive services will be made to victims. It also codifies that translation and interpretive services be available in the proceedings. I don't want to take up more of the committee's time with logistics as I believe the um, impact of these pardons can be better understood uh, by uh, the, from the next uh, two testifiers. I want to thank you for your time and consideration, and I will uh, be happy to take any questions the committee may have when the time is appropriate. Thank you. Our next testifier is Sarah Foreman. Want to go ahead and make your way up? And then on deck, we have Tim Morin, so you can go ahead and uh, come up to the table now, too. Welcome to the committee, and uh, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Hi, I'm Sarah Florman. I'm the Public Policy Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. MinCASA is a statewide membership coalition driving transformative culture change to address sexual violence through advocacy, prevention, racial justice, and systems change. MinCASA acts as a collective voice of organizations and individuals committed to ending sexual violence. MinCASA stands with Violence Free Minnesota in support of House File 2788. Our coalitions represent over 120 programs serving victim survivors of domestic and sexual violence across the state. In our work, we hear from our member programs as well as directly from victim survivors. They've told us that they want stronger, safer communities, alternatives to the criminal justice system, and opportunities for restoration and healing. This bill, establishing a clemency review commission and making much needed changes to how pardons are granted, reflects what we are hearing from those whose lives have been impacted by violence. What victim survivors want most is to have their voices heard, and this bill speaks to that need. We are also here today in support of victim survivors that have been involved in the criminal justice system after fighting back against their abusers or for crimes directly related to the abuse they endured. Abusers may threaten victim survivors or their families and children in order to coerce participation in criminal activity. Victim survivors may find themselves in situations where they feel they have no recourse but to fight back and survive or to be killed. Incarceration serves to further traumatize victim survivors and eliminates the opportunity for healing for the individuals, families, and communities involved. Providing broader opportunities for pardons to be granted will allow us to correct past injustices. The establishment of a clemency review commission will enable individuals with expertise in both systems and communities to have a voice in ensuring that the criminal justice system provides justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next testifier is Tim Moran. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning. My name is Tim Moran. Um, Chair Moeller and legislature representatives, um, I come to you to talk to you about AHF 27. Excuse me, sorry. Before I talk to you guys about my experience, I would like to educate you on the man that I am. I'm a firefighter. I'm an EMT. I'm a husband and I'm a father. I'm a business owner and I supply jobs to our community. I mentor troubled youth. I speak to youth groups where my message is, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And how uh, small decisions will turn into big decisions real quick. Um, I mentor troubled youth. Um, excuse me, I lost my spot. Um, I, have been, I have not been in any major trouble since my conviction. I haven't had as much as a speeding ticket in 10 years. I was awarded though civilian life saving award and have built uh, excuse me, uh, the civilian, the Chisago County, Chisago County Life Civilian Saving Award has built playgrounds for women with shelters, served in soup kitchens, served the homeless. I built homes for Habitat of Humanity. I've counseled individuals trying to find their place after serving time, and I'm a good Samaritan and a member of this community. Um, lastly, and most importantly, I am a man of faith. I tell you this not because I want to glow up, but more because I want you to have an understanding that this current process, the current process, the type of person this is failing. So some of the things that I have to overcome every t two years and, ever, and continue to overcome because of my felony when I was 18 years old, 19 years ago, is I have to sit in front of the MSCB board, the NREMT board, the MBFTE board every other year to keep my licensing. I have to prove to them every time that I am worthy of it. It has affected me in other ways. I've had to 
find people to, to give me the opportunity to have a job, to get back to this community, it's something that happened 19 years ago when I was a child. My, I'm not able to mentor troubled youth through authorized programming because they do background checks and because I have a felony on my record. I am not able to, uh, my wife and I have always wanted to adopt children. I'm not able to do that. And uh, I'm not able to coach my kids sports. So 19 years ago, I made the greatest mistake of my life. I hung out with a group of troubled youth at 18 years old, and through a series of decisions, I made life changing. <laughs> decisions that affected not only myself, but many others. I'm not here to describe it that night, but I have lived with this sense of, and, oh, excuse me, I lost my spot again. Oh, life change decisions that affected me and not but many others. I don't discredit what has happened, that, what happened that night. I have lived with it since, and no pardon or any other decision will ever change the way that it has permanently affected me. It took me 14 years to be exact to feel that I was worthy of considering this option. I had friends and family beg me and give me a sh to give it a shot. They told me I would think about it. I told them I would think about it and I don't deserve it. It wasn't until I came across that accident that I was awarded the life saving award and decided maybe I was worth it. See, I didn't just stop for any old accident or uh, any accident on the side of the road. I stopped for anyone who seemed like they needed it. it. Just so happened that this individual needed it far more than any of the others combined. I wasn't supposed to be there that day and I wasn't supposed to have the equipment that was needed to help the individual. So I took it as a sign and I applied. I began the process. The process is long and grueling. It brought back a lot of hurt and questions of, his, of if I was worthy. After submitting my entire record, my BCA record, my other background records, and all the others with the, uh, their respective stamp seals from the departments, I also provided the details of my case. Then I had to provide the details of the account that I have been up to since my release, why I deserved it, and what I plan to do with the pardon. This all sounds easy, but it has a lot. It had a lot more. It was a lot more involved than that. Once that was submitted, I had to wait. I finally received the acceptance letter with me. It, letter to meet with the pardon board, with the Board of Pardons. On that day, I remember feeling very uh, more nervous than I felt in a long time. I checked, I checked in and stood in the lobby and proceedings that began. I sat and watched as they worked their way case by case until they got to me. I knew a few cases prior that I wasn't in a good position since the man that, the man prior to me was in a similar situation and a board member, a certain board member spoke up and said, before anybody else could say anything, I do not support this pardon as there was life lost. And like that, the gavel had dropped and he was gone. No explanation or anything. When it came to my turn, I choked out and had uh, what I had drafted and tried to make it somewhat audible. My pastor spoke on my behalf and so did my business partner. Once that was all done, the board members asked their respective questions, most of them about my driving record when I was younger. Since being released uh, and I answered the questions and seemed to be happy with the answers. The vote came up and I got two out of three volts to pardon me. The third said the exact same thing. I'm almost done. As the prior case mentioned like that, in uh, like the, the last case I was mentioned and like that the gavel was dropped. I made my way out of the courtroom. The victim's family hugged me and said, sorry, it didn't work out. They'd showed up to support me. I remember feeling my uh, many feelings but the one that stood out the most was if I had gotten two out of three to support me and the victim's family not only supported me but took the time to show up and speak, then shouldn't that have more weight than one person's vote to uphold the reputation? This process is difficult and I don't feel many deserve it, but those who prove it and deserve it through years of actions that support it should have something to strive for. That's all I've got. Thank you so much for your testimony, and we really do appreciate you sharing your story with us. We did not have any members of the public sign up to testify, um, but so we can move on to member discussion. Representative Whitty. Okay. 
Thank you, Chair Muller. Um, thank you uh, for bringing this bill. Question I have for you is um, in the bill, I think we have, could be unintended consequences, but 6.14, it talks about granting a pardon, um, set aside a conviction and purge um, the conviction from an individual's criminal record. The individual is not required to disclose the conviction. And it then says on 6.4, during uh, one point, I'm sorry, 6.14, during the licensing process for peace officers. So they're going to do a background check. If you don't disclose that, that could make the backgrounder assume that they're trying to hide something. So would we want that disclosed um, for an important job like that? Representative Ed uh, Thank you, Chair Muller, and thank you, Representative Woody, for the question. Um, so the, the, the pardons, the, the essential essence of a pardon is that the person is kind of relieved of, of what they've done in the, in the conviction. Um, and I think it's important that if the person has really turned around and has really moved on from that period of time in their life, that they should be able to move into different spaces in society. And so I believe that that's why that's in there. But if there's other questions that you have about it, I'm happy to talk with you more offline. Representative Woody. Uh, I can even talk to you offline about it, but I do think when a backgrounder does a check and something like that is not disclosed, it's going to, I think it's going to bring up a red flag and per, um, prohibit them from getting that position. So I, I, I think you might want to look at that a little differently. Um, and then I, I guess also in other in roles like teachers, stuff like that, how would that be, you know, when you're dealing with the youth and that? But I'm just speaking from a law enforcement standpoint that I think it could create a little bit of an issue. And maybe Commissioner Snell can answer that question. Yep. Um, we'll go to Commissioner Snell. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Woody, I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. I think what the, what the law really would provide is that really can't be used against them. But they are authorized by statute uh, here not to make that disclosure. Um, obviously, there is a, it's, you know, the granting of clemency is a weighty decision and, and something that uh, requires much. And so what the law really provides is they don't have to make that disclosure and it would be, um, it would be inappropriate really for that to be counted against them if that pardon had been granted by, uh, by the board. Anything further, Representative Woody? Okay. Um, Chair Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Chair Muller. And um, I know I, he stepped out of the room, but I think um, I hope that folks were listening to the, the testimony uh, from the testifier here and you know we, we talk about repaying a debt to society and at what point has what more is a person to do to repay that debt um, if we've got someone serving our community in the ways that um, he's serving his community you know almost 20 years later you know at what point uh, do we say that it is it is enough and um, if if a representative like Badge, if, if folks can pass on, um, that was some really impactful testimony, and I think it's incredibly important that we had that on the record and that we're hearing from the folks most directly impacted by this. So thank you. Um, representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, antiquated was the word that was used to describe the current system um, where the Attorney General, the Governor, and the Chief Justice consider these applications. Antiquated, it makes it sound like something ancient, something from long, long ago. But 2018 is when this graph starts. 300% increase in applications. It almost doubled between 2020 and 2021. This proposal very much seems like the solution to a problem that was very recently created. Um, Representative Badgey, I'm, I'm interested in hearing um, your insights into why this dramatic increase in applications and what are the factors that are going into it. Representative Badgey. Uh, thank you, Chair Muller. Thank you, Representative Hudson. So I think my understanding about the increase in applications is there's just been a greater awareness, I think, for folks who are leaving 
our incarceration system about the pardon process. And so I think people have been encouraging that for folks to be able, if they've turned their lives around, to be able to ensure that that's removed from their record. Um, so I would, I would say that more outreach, more education, more awareness has probably led to those increased applications. Representative Hudson. Where is the awareness coming from? Like who's engaging in an effort to make people aware of a process um, that previously only attracted a third of the current interest? Representative Agbaje. Thank you, Chair Muller. Thank you, Representative Hudson. I believe there's a number of advocacy groups that work with reentry for um, prisoners and those formerly incarcerated. There's a number of church groups. There's a number of just community groups that want to see people become reacclimated into their communities. Um, as you heard from the testifier, they are doing the work in their communities, and I do think their families and their friends and their networks probably encourage them to look at receiving a pardon to remove that from their record. Representative Hudson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, another question. In the appointments to commissions um, section of the bill, starting in line 227 and going on to about three, six or so, um, all of the criteria that's listed um, for the appointing authorities to take into consideration when they're looking to appoint members to this um, new commission. The one at 229, experience addressing systemic disparities, including but not limited to disparities based on race, gender, and ability. So we want members on this commission, the, the purpose of the commission is to consider applications for pardon. We want them to have experience addressing systemic disparities. Why? Are we, is the objective here to give people a pardon or to, to heavily weight the likelihood of granting them a pardon based on the color of their skin or other demographic characteristics? Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Chair Moeller. Thank you, Representative Hudson, for the question. I believe the purpose of having people with varied experiences on the commission is to ensure that they're weighing those applications and weighing all the factors of those applications, as well as having a, an understanding that our incarceration system right now does have, unfortunately, disproportionate effects on communities of color, uh, women, and people who are disabled in our communities. And final question, Representative Hudson. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Um, I guess, I guess rather than continue a line of questioning, I'll just uh, end with a comment, which is I'm I deeply troubled by the idea that, first of all, we're expanding pardons dramatically, exponentially, in a very short period of time to the point where we have to redevelop our entire process for how we handle them because the spigot is so wide open. Um, but also, and perhaps more so, the idea that we're going to incorporate um, race and gender and all these demographic factors into our consideration of whether or not uh, it is just to grant a pardon, um, I find deeply unacceptable. The, the objective facts of a case and a person's um, behavior and demonstrated uh, tendencies ought to be the considering factors, not who or what they are. Thank you. All right, further member discussion? Lee Novotny. Thank you, Chair Moeller, and it's just more a comment. Uh, I, I do hope you work with Representative Witte uh, on the on the amendment um, regarding the line 614. And uh, my brief comment will just be that this uh, seems like we're fixing a problem that doesn't exist, and we're, we're doing a whole board to thing. If, if um, I have faith in the community. The testifier himself, um, that's how well the system works. Um, I don't know why we're fixing it. Thank you. Um, and since that's the final one, if you want to address that in your closing comments, <coughs> Representative Agbaje. <coughs> Sorry, um, something in my throat. <coughs> um, I'll try to be brief. Um, basically, 
There's no other member questions. Um, basically, we are looking at this because the current Board of Pardons in Minnesota does not actually um, issue as many pardons as some of our neighboring states. Um, South Dakota is one to look at. If you look at our populations and our populations of incarcerated folks, when they return from prison, South Dakota is actually moving further ahead. And so what we're trying to do in Minnesota is ensuring that we have a systemic process that continues to be fair, uh, looks at the cases, continues to make sure that we are addressing people's needs through the process. And so we've developed a bill to try to ensure that more people who co come through this system are able to um, utilize the system and that it's able to be effective for more people. Thank you. I'll renew my motion that House File 2788, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. All those in favor signify sure, by saying aye. I request a roll call. We're, I don't know what the rules are, uh, Representative Votney, because I was already calling for the Sorry. vote. Take a roll call. I want this on the record. All right. Do it. All right, fine. We'll go ahead and do a roll call. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, the clerk will take a roll. Let me just state what it is right now. So the motion is that House File 2788, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Moeller? Aye. Moeller, yes. Vice Chair Feist? Aye. Feist, yes. Representative Novotny? Novotny, no. Novotny, no. Representative Becker-Finn? Aye. Becker-Finn, yes. Uh, Representative Curran? Aye. Curran, yes. Representative Ingen? No. Ingen, no. Representative Frazier? Frazier, aye. Frazier, yes. Representative Hollins? Hollins, aye. Hollins, yes. Representative Hudson? No. Hudson, no. Representative Hewitt? Yes. Hewitt, yes. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes no. Mueller, no. Representative Tapke? Yes. Tapke, yes. Representative Witte? No. Witte, no. With eight ayes and five nays, that concludes the roll call vote. What is it? I think it's six. Six. Oh, sure. There being eight ayes and five nays, the motion prevails. All right, thank you. Next up, we have House File 1838. It's a Vice Chair Feist bill. I will move to lay over House File 1838. I do see that we have a DE1 amendment. And Vice Chair Feist, would you like to move your DE1 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would. All right, and it's my understanding that the A6 amendment is reflected in the DE1 amendment, is that correct? That is correct. All right, and since this is a DE, we'll move straight to the vote. All those in favor of the DE1 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The DE1 amendment is adopted. All right, now you can tell us about your bill as amendment. As amended, please. Great, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, committee. Uh, so House Bill 1838 reflects a historic agreement and collaboration between the three probation delivery systems to ensure adequate and equitable funding. Uh, this bill also incorporates important oversight and reforms aimed at creating more consistency in community supervision statewide and to address dramatic racial disparities and outcomes. It creates a community supervision advisory committee um, to gather and report data, develop a statewide training, coaching, and quality assurance system, uh, and regularly assess our systems for efficacy and fairness. It also eliminates supervision fees, and it incorporates um, House File 485, Representative Holland's uh, bill involving technical violations, um, and, and Carly Stark can talk to that with specificity because it may not incorporate the entire. Um, it was the price that everyone felt comfortable with. Um, it also creates a targeted innovation fund, which was a recommendation by the Council of State Governments. Um, the goal is to reward desirable approaches and outcomes by rewarding not just efficiency, but positive shifts in how community supervision is administered. Um, this targeted innovation fund um, can be used to pay cost of mandated services and tracking um, because we know that inability to pay for these mandated services and tracking um, 
um, is often considered a technical violation. Um, it also can incorporate uh, family-centered probation uh, programming. You'll hear a bit about that type of programming. Um, and we've also incorporated the alternatives to incarceration language. So the funding can be used to facilitate access to community options, including but not limited to inpatient substance use disorder treatment for nonviolent controlled substance offenders to address and correct behavior that is or is likely to result in a technical violation of the conditions of release. Um, so I am very excited about this bill. Um, and um, uh, it, I guess um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We have a lot of test fires. We're going to go super fast, each one of us. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And you, we do have a lot of testifiers. I noticed that the remote person was um, given a little longer time, but everybody else was told a very strict timeline to mm -hmm. stick to. So we really appreciate it if they do that. Um, first up, we have Commissioner Rena Moran. Um, unless you wanted to do the remote one first, Representative Feist, I wasn't sure what order you had. You know, I, I don't think it matters. Whatever is administratively easy. And I'm going to move down one. And so people who are on deck can like. Yeah, that'd be great. And then Commissioner. Um, uh, Trista Mattis Castillo is up next then. All right, welcome back to our committee. Um, Commissioner Moran, please uh, introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Rena Moran, Ramsey County Commissioner. Go ahead. So Ramsey County is pleased to share with you our strong support of House File 1838. This is a bill that I carried last year and could not get it across the finish line. So I am very excited to see it before you again. This bill that is supported by most counties, counties if not all counties, uh, here in Minnesota. In January of, 22, of 2022, I was appointed onto the Governor's Council of Justice, Council of Justice Reinvestment. Justice Reinvestment Initiatives is a data-driven approach to improve public safety, reduce corrections and related criminal justice spending, and reinvest savings and strategies can, that can de decrease crime and reduce recidivism. This keeps our community safe. The council included leaders in corrections and community supervision agencies, the governor's office, the legislature, and judiciary, as well as other key stakeholders like probation officers across the state, rural and urban, including those impacted by systems. House File 1838 corrects decades of underfunding and creates a new community supervision formula to ensure that a critical part of our public safety system is adequately funded into the future and those entering our community across the state after incarceration can have the support they need to, lo to lower recidivism and keep our community and towns safe. Community supervision is a fundamental part of the criminal justice system in Minnesota and funding sufficient to ensure effective services is vital to public safety in all communities across the state. The new formula was created by the AMC Community Supervision Work Group, which included representatives from all three probation delivery systems. The work group hired the American Probation and Parole Association to conduct a statewide workload study to determine adequate staffing levels for delivery of evidence-based practices. We also appreciate that the bill creates the Community Supervision Advisory uh, Committee which puts a structure in place to continue this historic collaboration between the state, the county, tribal nations, and community groups. Uh, because it's really important that we ensure that Minnesota continues to be on the cutting edge of evidence-based probation. We know, and <coughs> we know that black, indigenous, and brown communities are disproportionately impacted by being stopped, by being searched, by being incarcerated, and also put on probation. So let's make probation a more humane process. When those re entering or receiving probation have the resources that they need to be successful in the community, from mental health services, to pathways to a job or job training, housing, support services, et cetera. This is a public safety bill 
this is an equity bill. And I would like to thank Representative Feist for bringing forward this important bill. And we hope that you will join us in supporting it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Trista Mattis Castillo. And on deck online, we have Wani at B2 Bald Eagle. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Trista Mattis Castillo, Chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners. The funding proposal of HF 1838 represents a historic collaboration between the state, our counties, and other stakeholders. The formula has two primary components. The first one is the base of funding for each county to provide stability over time. And the second, a per capita distribution that factors in probationary uh, risk, staffing needs, and other essential costs of doing business. It distributes funding equitably across the state and is fully funded, and if fully funded, will ensure probation services are effective and evidence-based. It also simplifies legislative oversight of the entire probation system by consolidating the three separate pots of funding per delivery system into one fund that provides all the appropriations for community supervision statewide. The bill also creates a community supervision advisory committee that is charged with creating supervision standards. It creates a structure to ensure collaboration continues long into the future. We've worked for almost two years on this solution to the supervision challenges outlined by Commissioner Moran. We asked for advice and input from local experts in the field, as well as data collection and analysis from the Council of State Governments and the American Probation and Parole Association. This collaborative effort has created a bipartisan proposal to address the issues in probation practices and investments in Minnesota. This bill is the result of Minnesotans coming together in, to identify local solutions to a long-standing problem. Ramsey County passed a resolution supporting a new funding formula on February 1st, 2023. And by March 21st, we anticipate that all 87 counties will have passed the same resolution. I have 86 of those resolutions here with me today. McLeod just has a meeting on the 21st, which they expect to pass their resolution. We have uh, representation from counties uh, in this room from across the whole state here today. Um, and we ask for your support in this historic effort to truly come together and work for this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And before we move to our online testifier, uh, next on deck, who can come up to the tables? Midge Christensen and Commissioner Schnell. Our next testifier is Wani Etu Bald Eagle and online, so hopefully everything works. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, Chair Moeller and members of the committee. Uh, I wrote a letter here today to convey the thought, my thoughts and make sure I stay in the allotted time slot. So forgive me, but um, this will be short. My name is Wani Etu Bald Eagle, Winnie for short. I'm a strong Lakota Sioux woman who believes change is possible. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm a state certified peer recovery specialist I currently reside in Montevideo in rural Minnesota. I work every day with people in active addiction to recovery on probation, ISR, and child protection services. I attend their court hearings, safety team meetings, and help them find their strengths and personal goals. I provide peer support, resources, and advocacy with care and compassion, giving them hope, knowing they don't have to do this alone. I am also a convicted felon, still on supervision. I served five years in Shakopee Prison. The first time was released, violated my supervision, and was revoked for two years. I entered the CIP program, which started my road to change. I learned about myself and how to create structure in my life, but the real challenge came when I returned to the community. That's where the real work begins and where I really needed the most support. The majority of my past supervision experiences were like a cattle call system. Come in, give you a touch base, don't dig into anything too deep, and be on my way. <clears throat> I felt like a number, like I didn't matter. Intense supervised release was very structured, mainly accountability based. A big part of ISR is getting a job and having a set schedule every week. I got a full-time job at the sugar beet plant, became part of the union, worked hard 12-hour rotating shifts, got my locomotive operator's license. But as I spent more time adjusting to the community, the more I experienced real-world issues, struggles, and problems. Relationship issues 
back with my family, reuniting with my children, making everyday decisions in a positive way. Luckily, I transferred my super supervision to a rural agency where I was not treated like a number. For the first time, I felt people had the time to see me as an individual that helped ease the stigma. I felt like I mattered and human, that I could bring up problems and they would help me with them. That also gave me the confidence that I could be a better person. They believed in me being able to succeed, not that I would simply fail. The agents that supervise me and 6WCC have the time on their caseloads to work with me individually, not like a revolving door. Time with my agent is what really matters. Time to work on goals, time to learn new things, new ways of thinking and coping, getting new perspectives on my choices and practicing new skills. Sometimes your agent just having the extra time to get to know an individual and invest in them as a person makes all the difference. I know others who have not succeeded on supervision, but good supervision can make all the difference, and it did for me. If they had the time and benefit with their agent that I have to learn and practice, I think they all could have succeeded as well. My supervision wasn't perfect. I relapsed at one point. My father passed, and I was struggling. I didn't have the good working. If I, if I didn't have the good working relationship that I had with my agents, where there was care and compassion and empathy, I probably would have been just another failing statistic. They had the time to help me work through my relapse, not just revoke my supervision. Every person on supervision around the state deserves equal access to the best care possible, to the same opportunities to succeed. I would ask that the committee fully fund supervision as needed because it works. It worked for me. Thank you so much. Thank for, you. Yes, thank you for your testimony, for sharing your um, story with us, and, and congratulations on your on the good work you're doing. Um, next up, we have Midge Christensen. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Yes, good morning, Chair Moeller and members of the committee. I will try and go very quickly. Um, my name is Midge Christensen. I am the Community Corrections Director for Six West Community Corrections. Our agency is comprised of four very small, very rural counties out on the South Dakota border. I've been the director of Six West Corrections for 22 years, and I was a probation agent for eight years before that. Because my agency is small, I wear a lot of hats, including supervising clients to assist in changing their criminal behavior. And I'm also responsible for implementing policies and programming that affect the safety of our communities. And I want to add that I have also been, at some point in my life, a consumer of the criminal justice system, if you will. Um, when I was 20, my 17-year-old brother was killed by a drunk driver. And so my family and I have wrestled with this notion of justice and restoration, not only for victims, um, but for the individual who committed the offense. So I know firsthand what this is about, both through my work, through my personal experience. Committee members, as we sit here today, we know more than at any previous point in time what it takes to achieve safe communities. There's an entire body of correctional evidence and research that's growing every day that tells us how to deliver that effective supervision that Winnie talked about. Effective supervision helps people get out of their trouble cycle and make meaningful changes in their lives. You heard firsthand from Ms. Bald Eagle how it has made a difference in her life. And as a matter of fact, earlier today, I heard representatives on both sides of this aisle talk about how people come to a crucial point in their life with addiction that when you know, you know, and you want help. And the important part of that is that lots of times that happens when people are on supervision with us. And in order to be able to extend that help, effective supervision takes well-trained, caring corrections agents with adequate time and caseload size to do that work. We need time to respond when public safety is at risk, and we also need time to meet with clients in a meaningful way to teach them new skills and provide critical in interventions. Everyone under supervision deserves that level of service. And the state has a duty to ensure that equitable funding is provided statewide so public safety decisions are not made based on how much money is available alone or on geography alone. Community supervision is not making widgets on an assembly line, folks. It's humans working with humans. Right now, Minnesota contributes the lowest percentage of state general funds out of all 50 states into our correctional system, the lowest. 
Our communities are demanding improved outcomes from the criminal justice system, which cannot be achieved without resources. Stagnant funding and an antiquated, inequitable funding model is preventing Minnesota from moving forward, and it's time to fix this problem. Please fully fund community supervision using the funding model provided for in House File 1838. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Next up, we have Commissioner Schnell, and then on deck, we have Jason Anderson. I'll go ahead, Commissioner. Please introduce yourself again. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, my name is Paul Schnell, Commissioner for the Department of Corrections. I want to thank Representative Feist uh, for carrying this bill and leading on this critical issue for Minnesota's public safety. The Department of Corrections has a unique role in that the agency provides pass-through or subsidy funding to county providers. We also have an oversight role, and we are the executive branch agency charged with providing an array of reporting to you as the state's policymakers. And based on the county's choice, we are, in some cases, a provider of supervision services. We, uh, the DOC, is one of the three delivery systems. The governor and lieutenant governor share the belief on the goals this bill advances, equitable access to delivery of supervision services across our state, sufficient funding to support the supervision system's work to advance public safety, and uh, comprehensive and statewide use of evidence-based probation practices, along with transparency and accountability in delivering a return on investment or improved uh, probation outcomes and public safety. Chair members, uh, the way the state provides funding to the supervision system is at least a 40-year problem. Uh, I know this because I remember being freshly out of college uh, and hearing discussions about the supervision system funding being an issue at state corrections conferences I attended. Except for the fact that I am 40 years older, not much has changed since then. It's time to fix this decade-long problem. The governor recognizes the significant need to appropriately fund Minnesota's probation and supervision system and to ensure safe and improved public safety outcome. The governor's budget request includes a substantial and ongoing increase uh, in funding for the three systems of just over $40 million. Funding for tribal nations to provide supervision or related correctional services to their members. And you will see and hear a, a bill later on today's agenda dis discussing that. You will also see a request in the governor's uh, rec, rec um, for grant funding to support community-based programs that support community supervision and improved outcomes. A key priority of the administration is addressing justice by geography. And these funds will ensure that gap services such as expanded access to responsive, culturally relevant, supportive services and treatment services can be accessed anywhere in our state, especially greater Minnesota, where access may be limited or stretched. Members, I want to be sure to note that the, there are a few provisions related to oversight, transparency, and accountability mechanisms that the DOC would like to see added to the bill. Because we have a shared commitment to improving our community supervision system, we are engaged in productive conversations around these agency priorities with our county partners, which will continue as this bill moves forward. Madam Chair, members, I thank you for your attention to this important bill. I again thank Representative Feist and all of our county supervision partners for the work done on this bill. Thank you, Commissioner. Next up, we have Jason Anderson. And on deck, we have Tammy Jo Lieberg. Go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members, Jason Anderson. I'm the past president of the Minnesota Association of County Probation Offices, and I'm the former director of Itasca County Probation. If you want a road report, they were pretty tough this morning. Um, we facilitate the successful transition out of the criminal justice system. You've heard some amazing testimony this morning related to other bills about, you know, substance abuse and mental health and all of these ongoing, that's our work, that's what we do. The more effective we can do that work, the better the outcomes for our clients, the better the outcomes for crime victims, the better the outcomes for taxpayers. These aren't mutually exclusive outcomes, everybody wins the better we are. Ms. Bald Eagle, in her testimony, so eloquently said this morning that it, it was time with my agent that mattered most. It was time with my agent that mattered most. It's common across the state of Minnesota for probation officers to have caseloads of 150 or more, even felony caseloads. It's time with my agent that matters the most. An investment in community supervision is 
a long-term investment in the solutions. Madam Chair, you said at the first hearing this morning, boy, some of these things are great band-aid reports or things we need to do about the fentanyl epidetic, epidemic, but we need to think bigger and, and make longer-term investments. This is part of that. This is an important part of that. Now, I love the sound of my own voice, and I could talk all morning, but you have a lot, so <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Tammy Jo Lieberg, and on deck, we have Julie Matinick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, my name is Tammy Jo Lieberg, and I'm the 2023 MAC Act President, which is Minnesota Association of Community Corrections Act Counties, and the Director of Candy High Community Corrections in um, Minnesota. Today, I'm representing MAC Act in support of community supervision funding in House 1838. We appreciate that the Chair and the Committee recognize the importance of community supervision in the state of Minnesota. Com community corrections is critical to public safety. We need to remember that as we start at, it's the end part of the process, but every part of our partners from law enforcement to the courts are dependent on community corrections to get their jobs done and to affect that critical public safety component at the end. Confusion about what community supervision is and how it is funded has resulted in severe underfunding for many, many years. Counties have come before this committee year after year looking for a solution to this ongoing problem that puts public safety at risk. After the Justice Reinvestment Bill did not pass in 2022, the Association of Minnesota Counties created a work group and hired a consultant to perform a statewide workload study and create a new formula. Many of my fellow committee members are here in this room today. This year we brought the solution to you. Our work group consisted of six commissioners, including metro, suburban, and rural counties across the state, two community supervision experts from each of the delivery systems, which included the Department of Corrections, and we met weekly for nine months and are here before you proposing with a proposal that represents hundreds of hours of data-driven work that we put together. Community supervision is critical to providing a safe and equitable and balanced criminal justice system in the state of Minnesota. And our goal is to provide, to provide accountability and ultimately change the behavior to reduce recidivism. The funding in this propo proposal is about ensuring that we are investing in our system to get the outcomes that we want. The current funding system is not equitable or- I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you could just please wrap it up because yep. we really need to move on. <laughs> nor consistent, which means different outcomes for clients based heavily on where they live. MAC Act supports this proposal and we thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I know there's been like hundreds of hours put into this, so it's really hard to narrow it down to such a short presentation, but thank you so much. Thank All you. All right, next up we have Julie Nantinet. If you could please keep your testimony brief too, we'd appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Feist. My name is Julie Matnich. I'm here on behalf of the nonprofit organization Children of Incarcerated Caregivers to testify in support of the Targeted Innovation Fund. This fund could support transformational initiatives like the creation of family-focused probation programs. Research by Dr. Rebecca Schlafer at the University of Minnesota and others shows that 17% of Minnesotans have experienced parental incarceration. Parental incarceration correlates to adverse outcomes for kids, including poor school readiness, behavioral challenges, and mental health challenges. Family-focused probation programs can interrupt pathways to incarceration. Reports on a pilot program in Oregon suggest that probation geared to the needs of parents and their children reduces recidivism, and keeps children out of foster care. Probation officers observe their clients demonstrating increased patience with their children and increased motivation to be successful on probation. Minnesota stakeholders support family-focused probation. For example, Olmstead County Corrections envisions that with funding for a pilot program, they could employ a dedicated probation officer with a reduced caseload to more effectively connect families to individualized and holistic services, including parenting classes, chemical dependency, and mental health treatment, and other education to help parents succeed on probation and to help their children. In 2017, Dr. Schlafer and her team conducted a survey which showed that 78% of fathers and 85% of mothers in 65 Minnesota correctional facilities were interested in parenting classes 
with parenting, parents wanting to do better for their kids and probation officers having resources and desire to support them, we believe that something very positive can happen for Minnesota kids through this month. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we had no members of the public sign up, so we'll move on to member discussion. All right, uh, Lee Nabatni. Thanks, Chair Muller. Um, as most of you know, I was on the commission with then Representative um, Moran as, as we worked through this a uh, year and a half ago in the summer. And my understanding of a task force, our goals were to figure out what is the most effective delivery system and how to fairly reimburse the counties that are doing. I'm sorry, was she going to? Oh, she's there for questions. Okay. If you have, yeah, it's uh, Carly Stark, but we'll, yeah, yeah go ahead. Wait, she wasn't there when I looked up. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, what was the fair way for the counties to be reimbursed for supervision of, of DOC cases? Um, we had a pretty good bill. We've done a lot of amendments as it's worked through. Um, and now we're coming in and we're throwing in language about um, technical violations and things like that. Why are we, I thought we were on a delivery and funding bill, not a policy bill. How is, so my question would be for the author, how are we getting to the point where we're throwing in other policy changes to what was a bipartisan and well worked out plan? Representative Feist. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, so, so we had um, guidance um, from that, that committee on which you served about how to more equitably and strategically distribute the funding, um, but there are also a lot of experts who think that we need to not just look at the, the funding, um, but also look at the delivery systems overall. So I know that the Council of State Governments worked very closely with the counties, um, and I will let Ms. Stark also respond, but, um, but I know that they also had a lot of input in terms of um, creating that advisory council. They were the ones who recommended that targeted innovation fund, um, and you know, my, the way I approached this bill is I tried to meet with all of the experts and, and really just try to do a deep dive to understand where are the challenges that, that we are facing in probation delivery and, and how can we address them in a comprehensive way through this bill. And um, if Carly Stark, if you wanted to add to that, please introduce yourself. Um, thank you, Chair, members of the committee. I'm Carly Stark with the Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, Yes, yeah, so the main, from the county perspective, the main parts of the bill is the formula and the creation of the Community Supervision Advisory Committee, um, which includes all of the data collection. Uh, but we know that there are other stakeholders asking for further reforms. Um, we don't, we are continuing to work with Representative Feist to try and make sure that the reforms are, um, in the goals of the bill. Um, we still have some changes to make, but uh, she has been very good about trying to listen to all sides and make changes so that everyone can agree to the final outcome. Representative Navani. Yeah, thank you, Chair Muller, and, and thank you for the, the answer. But I'm just concerned that we're once again getting away from what we're going to do, and we're throwing in things that we're taking away ability of the probation officers to, to effectively supervise them and provide. As a use of force instructor, I used to tell people um, the proper use of force early on at a lower level, well, in many cases, prohibit the need for a higher level of force later. We're throwing provisions in this bill that will take away abilities of the probation officers to supervise their cases. And I didn't think that was what we did this task force for. This is a very important bill. It's got to get done. I, I would just hope that before this comes to the floor, we just clean it up. I've, I've told people I support the bill. I'm happy to support the bill. It's going to be a very expensive bill, but it needs to get done. Can we just keep it clean and, and do that? That would be my request here. 
uh, vice chair Feist. Yep, thank you. I'm, I'm definitely happy to have in-depth conversations with you about any specific provisions of the bill. Um, I think there is a really innate tension between the reality that when we look at the macro level statistics around probation, that there are massive disparities. And, and so um, a way to address that is to create more consistency across the board. Um, and that is in tension with the, the very real expertise of the probation officers and their ability to exercise discretion and to, to do an individualized risk assessment. So these two things are in tension. Um, my goal with this bill is to provide the adequate funding so that programs like last year, we saw that wonderful video from Olmstead County. Um, and we've heard testimony about how when we adequately and strategically fund uh, probation that, that we can have better outcomes, more equitable outcomes. Um, but I, I feel like it's important to, to have this bill approach probation in a more holistic way. Um, but, but as Ms. Stark said, I, I've talked to everyone. I, we've had some conversations already. I'm happy to have more. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that I would do if I were just like doing whatever I wanted in this bill and they're not in this bill. Um, this bill, um, I feel is very balanced in terms of addressing some of those things that I think are an important reform, um, but also making sure that they're not so extreme that, that the stakeholders and the experts can't, can't work within what we've included. Um, Representative Tapke. Thank you, Chair Moeller. I just wanted to mention and thank, thank you to Representative Feist and uh, Commissioner Moran for all the work that everyone's done on this bill. It's a, one of the number one priorities for Scott County in, uh, in my district, and it's a really important thing because uh, funding is lacking. We're not able to deliver the services that we need to be delivering in Scott County and um, because the funding just isn't there. And uh, so just want to make sure everyone knows how important this bill is, and thank you very much for your work on it. Any closing remarks, Representative Feist? Yeah, thank you. Um, as, as Representative Novotny said, this is a very important bill that we are, we are finally at long last going to equitably and strategically fund um, community supervision in Minnesota. And I do look forward to ongoing conversations. I, I do think that, that, like I said, a holistic approach to this bill is very important. Sorry, I'll stop talking. We don't, we're running out of time. Um, but I'm very excited about this bill and um, look forward to ongoing uh, work on it. Thank you. Thank you, and I do appreciate all your work on this. Uh, early on, you took that on, and, and so appreciate that, and all the work you've done to Ms. Stark and all the others, and for the testimony today. I renew my motion and lay over House File 1838 as amended. The next bill is House File 1864. It's a Chair Becker Finn bill. I will move to lay over House File 1864. Um, Chair Becker Finn has the A1 amendment. Would you like to move and explain your amendment? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would move the A1. It, um is very technical. It's uh, literally changing some commas and just updating some language about the way we refer to tribal nations. All right, doesn't sound like there'll be any discussion on that. So all those in favor of the A1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails, the A1 amendment is adopted. Please tell us about your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair Moeller, and hopefully this, this will be a quick one. I know we're, we're short on time. Um, this bill was also incorporated uh, within the overall Represent Feist bill, but I do think it's important to bring this up separately as well. And what this would do is authorize tribal nations to provide uh, probation services uh, to their members. Uh, we know that probation and supervision is more successful when that connection uh, between the officer uh, and the probation officer and the subject uh, is, is better. And we, as not every tribal nation is going to be able to provide this, but for the ones that are able to, they can provide culturally responsive services and um, it's it's hard to explain to folks all the ways in which um, it's different, the way that we as uh, Native people interact with each other. And when you're more culturally informed, um, you know, the interaction is just different. And it's, uh, I just think that this is incredibly important to be able to uh, provide these services to our tribal members that understand um, our worldviews, understand the things that are important to us. And so that's, that's what this bill does. Um, We've been trying to do this for a while, so, uh, and Commissioner Schnell is also here. All right, welcome back again, Commissioner Schnell. Please introduce yourself and begin. Uh, again, uh, Chair Muller, members of the committee, Paul Schnell, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. 
Um, I want to, again, thank uh, Chair Rebecca Finn for carrying this bill. The DOC, like all state agency, engages in regular consultations with all of Minnesota's tribes. Through these consultations, we heard from tribal leaders very real concerns about supervision outcomes for members of their tribes. Tribal leaders would like to integrate the services provided they pro currently provide to their uh, members with community supervision, and this is the essence of community corrections. Tribal leaders want better outcomes for their people, and through consultation, we shared the belief that culturally relevant supervision services will produce better outcomes for Native Americans with system involvement. For the past several years, it has been the priority of the administration to extend state uh, authority and funding to tribal governments so they can provide supervision services to their members. House File 1864 amends Minnesota law to authorize tribal governments uh, to provide and provide uh, funding to provide supervision for their members if they choose to provide those services. Tribal governments electing to provide these services would be required to engage in the same processes that county jurisdictions currently do, including the requirement to establish a set of an advisory group and establish a, a comprehensive plan. This bill pairs with the governor's budget request for $2.75 million or $250,000 per tribe um, to, to apply to supervision services, either providing those services themselves or in collaboration with county services. Madam Chair, members, at this time, uh, when our state uh, works to develop a strategically sound and critically needed investments in, and policies to guide Minnesota's supervision services, it is right and timely for us to provide Minnesota's tribal governments the authority and funding to serve their members and our fellow Minnesotans to achieve better outcomes, which is good for the tribes, it's good for their members, uh, it's good for public safety, it's good for Minnesota. And with that, I would stand for any question you or members may have. Thank you, Commissioner. We didn't have any members of the public sign up, so do we have member discussion? All right. I'm not seeing any. Um, any closing comments, Chair Becker Finn? I uh, just appreciate the support and attention to this issue and the ways we can better serve everybody in our state. Thank you. Thank you. I renew my motion and lay over House File 1864 as amended. Members, the last bill we have on our agenda is House File 1300, <laughs> Vice Chair Feist, who is also getting her steps in today, back and forth here. Um, I move to lay over House File 1300. There are no amendments. And I know she's anxious to have our testifiers because they are from out of state. They came in, they've been patiently waiting all morning. So thank you. Um, go ahead and describe your bill, Vice Chair Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Committee. So this bill addresses the unconstitutional status quo, which is juvenile life without parole in Minnesota. And I'm just going to say up front that this bill uh, involves people who, as children, did bad things. So that is who we're talking about. And we're also going to talk about rehabilitation, um, what we actually need to do to protect public safety. Um, and I will mention up front that the rate of recidivism in the, I believe, 27 other states that have taken this step, um, I believe is 1.14%. So, so people who are positively impacted by similar, similar laws in other states have gone on to lead productive, fulfilling lives. So um, with that, I'll dive into the details. So in 2012, in Miller versus Alabama, the US Supreme Court banned sentences of mandatory life in prison without release for children under 18. The reason that they did that is because of children's diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform um, Juveniles are, quote, less deserving of the most severe punishments. So we're talking about um, what we know about children's brains, um, which we continue to know more and more about adolescent brain development. Um, Minnesota was one of the 28 states at that time whose sentencing laws became unconstitutional for juveniles after Miller. And it is one of just four states that have not fixed their laws at this point. Um, House file 1300 before you today would abolish the sentence of life in prison without release for children in Minnesota, making Minnesota the 27th state to do so. 
It would provide a review opportunity for those who have served at least 15 years in prison, and it does not guarantee release. And I will repeat that, it does not guarantee release. Um, some of these people um, cannot be released um, to protect public safety, um, but it would give them at least an opportunity. Um, and would establish a reviewing authority to make release decisions. Um, the data shows, um, just so we understand the scale that we're talking about, there are 97 people in Minnesota serving sentences of 15 years or more mm -hmm. for juvenile offenses. 40 people have already served over 15 years and would be immediately eligible for review. Again, not release, review. Um, and 81% of those people serving sentences of 15 years or more uh, for juvenile offenses are people of color. Um, revisions are being worked on with this bill. We are in discussions with stakeholders, which I think is really important. Um, we want to get this right. We want to make sure that people are comfortable with this. Um, and so uh, we are working with the Department of Corrections. We're working with the county attorneys associations, um, incorporating um, more voices in the process um, and, and a slightly different structure for that review. Um, and we are open to additional modifications and conversations. Um, we have support letters in your materials from the Hennepin and Ramsey County attorney's offices, as well as Violence Free Minnesota. Um, and I would like to direct you in particular to a statement from survivors and family members of victims of youth violence who wrote, quote, because of our painful experiences, we are deeply committed to the hope of redemption and second chances and a belief that all of us are more than the worst thing we have ever done. And with that, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you. Our first testifier is Preston Ship. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and committee members. I am Preston Ship. I serve as Senior Policy Counsel for the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. Um, greetings from Nashville, Tennessee, where last I checked it is 52 degrees. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's good to see, I uh, saw several of you yesterday, I wasn't able to see everybody, but it's good to see those of you again that I talked to yesterday. Um, before I started working for the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth, I spent a number of years working as a prosecutor in Tennessee. And, and our focus, even in cases where we were dealing with juveniles, the focus was on what that person had done. That's what we had time to, to think about, was what that person had done. We didn't really have the opportunity to ask, well, what could this person become? So if we had a 15-year-old who was charged with a terrible crime, a homicide, what we had to deal with was the facts of that case, the harm that that person had caused, the loss of life. We did not really have the opportunity to ask, who might this 15-year-old child be by the time he or she's a 30-year-old adult. And this bill gives us the opportunity to answer that question. And 26 other states, as you've already heard, have already concluded that's a good question to ask. It's a good idea on down the line to look and see who these people who have committed really bad crimes, but they were kids, and to find out who they are 15 years later. So this bill is modeled after something that West Virginia did way back in 2014. In West Virginia, any time a kid gets a sentence longer than 15 years, however they get there, they get parole review at 15 years. And in that nine years, the folks who have come home, and certainly not all of them, but the folks who have, they haven't had a single person commit a new offense. As you heard nationwide, the rate of recidivism is 1.14%. So we're talking about states, Oregon, Ohio, Arkansas, Massachusetts, Illinois, hopefully today New Mexico, will, the governor will sign that bill. Republican states, Democrat states, all concluding that it is important to find out what kids can become. It is important to not be so focused on the punishment that, that we neglect to think about the promise that all kids have to make positive change. And when we invest in that question, when we take that look, knowing that not everybody's coming home, there will be some people who unfortunately will die in prison for crimes they committed as kids because they can't be safely released. But for the ones who come home, and right now it's over 950 people nationwide are home who were told as kids that they had no hope but to die in prison, and they are doing remarkable remarkable things, finding really creative ways to serve their communities and make them safer. So I'll, I'm happy to take questions about the national trend. I know time's uh, of the essence, so I'll turn it over to my colleague. 
Thank you. Our next testifier is Eric Alexander. Please uh, introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the um, committee. I am Eric Alexander, uh, and I serve as senior advocate for the campaign for the fair sentencing of youth. Um, imagine, if you will, um, being young, impulsive, and impressionable. And during this stage in your teenage life, you commit or you are a participant in one of the worst acts that you could ever commit as a child. And decades later, all you want to do is show someone that you've changed, as children do. You possibly look like me, maybe not as handsome, but you probably look like me <laughs> and the other 900 children around the country who were told they'd die in prison. You see, I haven't always had the good fortune to serve as, as senior advocate. I was once one of the children that this type of policy gave a second chance, and I'm very similar to youth sentenced to lengthy sentences in your state, and that traumatic experiences in our early childhood put us all on the path to commit crimes that led us to prison. But I join you today as founding member of the Incarcerated Advocacy, uh, Children's Advocacy Network, or I can, a national network comprised of and led by individuals who went to prison as children for, for very severe crimes and who are now home living productive lives as elementary school teachers, substance abuse counselors, paralegals, entrepreneurs, are just a few of the ways that these individuals are serving their communities. States that have banned this practice, again, have resulted in over 900 youth who were sentenced to die in prison being released now. Over 230 of these men and women across 28 states are members of the ICANN network. We understand that we can never repay what we took. And with that in mind, like other youth in prison, we consciously decided to spend our time finding means to repay society for the mistakes that we made. And today, all we hope to do is to create a justice system that holds children accountable in age-appropriate ways and that accounts for their exposure to trauma and prepares them for reintegration into society. We've dedicated every day of our free lives to ensuring that no other family suffers the, the loss that victims suffered in our cases. We've tried to make sure that we pour our lives into the universities, of class, uh, universities classrooms, and the homes of many. This is the demonstrative of the fact that we are not monsters. Yes, we made critical errors in judgment as children, but we are all more than the worst thing that we've ever done. We just need an opportunity to prove it. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony and, and for the good work you're doing. Appreciate you, it. Um, we did not have anybody from the public sign up to testify, so we'll move on to member discussion. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Feist. And um, for our guests today, I did have the opportunity to talk with you yesterday and had a very um, productive conversation, I believe. Um, so um, as an educator for almost 20 years, I always talk to my students about um, how important it is for us to have um, a place and a space to make mistakes. And what we're talking about, we're discussing here, is obviously more than just a mistake of forgetting my homework and um, accidentally you know, doing something wrong. I get that. Um, rehabilitation is biblical. This is biblical. And we have to find that balance between holding people accountable and allowing them to be new, be redeemed. And I have some concerns that I want to talk about, but the idea that we're going to hold very young children to a life behind bars does not sit well with me. I was told my kiddos, I want you to be free to make mistakes here because sometimes out in the real world, those mistakes have real life adult consequences. And so let's, let's have that space here. Let's do that here. In the letter that we received from the Minnesota County Attorneys, um, they talked about how important it was for us to um, codify sections 9, 10, and 11 that talks about the Miller uh, case, but they struggled with an administrative process that was discussed in section five um, and asked for a judicial process that takes place in the community of the original offense. They believed that that would create transparency and a, an opportunity for victims to be heard. They also were very concerned about the idea of only 15 years, whereas when Representative O'Neill was on the working group, they had talked about 25. So um, I would just ask, um, knowing that 
um, this bill really it pulls at <laughs> this really pulls on me and want it uh, but I also want to do what is best by striking that correct balance so if you could address some of those and also if we could also talk about if uh, any of the things that is talking about here, this administrative, uh, sorry, the uh, judicial process has been replicated in other states, I would really appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Vice Chair Feist. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll respond to most of that and then I'll turn it over to my experts. Um, so we um, did appreciate conversations with the County Attorneys Association and based on those conversations, uh, we are going to require the reviewing authority to consider input from the sentencing judge, prosecutor, law enforcement personnel, and the victim's family. Um, so, so we appreciate that input. Um, regarding uh, having a full judicial review process, it would basically be retrying these, these people for offenses from many years ago. Um, this would be more costly, it would be slower, it would be more difficult, including for the victims and their families. Um, so this is both philosophically and procedurally um, not something that, that I think is the best approach. And, um, and I believe that, and actually I'm just gonna turn it over to my expert in terms of other states. So, uh, Mr. Shipp. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and yes, there are, um, there's a, a couple of states that, that utilize sort of a resentencing um, process. One of those that, that passed its bill in 2021 is Maryland. Um, the reason for that, of course, we, we're happy to support that bill. Um, the main reason for that was they just don't have a functioning parole system, that nobody had been released on parole in 25 or 30 years. And so the advocates there that we talked to, the, the experts there on the ground said, if you pass this as a parole bill, it's not going to do anything, you know. And so we said, well, then we at least need to empower judges to take a second look. Um, there is one kind of um, nightmare story not far away about how judicial resentencing work, and that's in Michigan, which right now has the largest population of juvenile lifers in the country. And they've worked really hard to try to resentence their way out of that problem. But what you end up with is, well, I should say what they have ended up with is some pretty wildly um, arbitrary results depending on where the thing is located as opposed to having a uniform board um, making the decision and then it triggers the whole appeals process as a matter of due process and they get it wrong. The judges will make a wrong determination under Miller and Montgomery, the Supreme Court decisions, the Court of Appeals catches it and then orders them to do it all over again. So they're spending over a million dollars a year on these things. They finally have got a legislative fix that Republicans and Democrats have come together on that will be heard next month. It's actually a 10-year parole review bill for everybody age 18 and under, so it's a little more ambitious than what's being done here. Um, but, uh, but, but long answer to a short question, there are states that are doing it, but by and large, what, what you see is sort of a uniform board making those decisions. Representative Mueller. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just uh, also to address uh, the concern about the 15 years. Um, that was the something that, uh, again, Representative O'Neill, who has been working on things like this in the past, um, the recommendation from what uh, she, what we both understood was that instead of 15 years or 10 years, that it would have been 25 years. I do know that when, I, I would like to just say in all full transparency, that um, when I was talking to our guests today that, um, you know, they were very um, transparent with me and told me that uh, almost never, and maybe never is too strong a word, or maybe it's exactly right, um, the first appeal is ever request or, or ever granted. This is never granted on the first time that they have asked for um, a pardon like this. And, and so it does take several years to, to do that. Um, when I was talking to our guests, they were telling me that um, even if, even if it was 15 years, that it would be close to 20 to 23 years when it finally was completed. But putting all that aside, um, the review board that was done here, or the review that was done here in Minnesota suggested 25 years. Just wondering why you're going to 15. Vice Chair Vice. Yeah, thank you. So that review board and their recommendations are a bit in dispute. <laughs> so, so I don't know that everybody would agree that that was their like black and white recommendation. So I will just mention that. Um, 
I um, feel very comfortable with the 15 years. It's based on national trends. As, as Mr. Ship mentioned, that some states have gotten even more ambitious. Um, right now, the default is 30 years. That's just what we defaulted to when we could no longer have our unconstitutional life, full life without parole. So 25 years is basically 30 years. Um, I mean, it basically is de facto juvenile life without parole. And so for that reason, I, I feel like 25 years is very long. And I will point out also, again, that two county attorneys wrote letters supporting uh, this bill and this structure. Um, and so, so the letter from the County Attorneys Association does not reflect like a homogenous view of all county attorneys across Minnesota. Um, but I, I guess I'll also just mention that I am very open to conversations about how this is structured. I think 15 years for a first look is, is good, but I'm also very open to having conversations about different scenarios and whether or not we want to make any sort of additional permutations. Right. Any further member discussion? All right. Oh, Representative Whitty. Thank you, uh, Chair Muller, and thank you, Chair, uh, Representative Feist, for bringing this forward. How many juveniles um, would this apply to that are under uh, in the state? Vice Chair Feist. Yep, thank you. So there are 97 people in Minnesota who are serving sentences of 15 years or more for juvenile offenses. Um, 40 people have already served 15 years, so they would be eligible for a first look. And again, not release, but just a first look. Um, so, so that's the number of people we're talking about. Representative Woody. Thank you. Um, in any of the crimes uh, were, sorry, I'm having troubles reading. Um, under the heinous crimes or dangerous sex offender statutes, would that apply to this too? Vice Chair Feist. So um, my understanding is that our heinous crimes law is unconstitutional, and I think they all fall under that. Um, so, so all of the people who would be subject to this bill did very bad things. Um, that's who we're talking about. Um, but we're also talking about a status quo that's unconstitutional. Um, and even people who do very bad things deserve constitutional protections. Um, so, so yeah, um, they, they did bad things. <laughs> um, and that is why they are currently incarcerated for a very long time. Um, but we need to look at what we know about adolescent brain development, which we know more and more. Um, we know about the potential for rehabilitation, for contribution as members of our society that we can trust and feel safe around. Um, and, and so, you know, we need to give them at least an opportunity to revisit um, how long they will be incarcerated. All right. Um, Lee Novotny. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Inkin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Representative Witte, Representative Feist, I just looked up as of 10.9 uh, back page there. Um, it does include that for um, folks who were convicted of extreme inhumane conditions in sexual assault, including heinous elements of torture, um, great bodily harm, mutilation, and a number of other things that are just hard to stomach. I'm just wondering if we can figure out if 15 years really is appropriate for this, because as it currently sits, you can be 17 years old, 364 days, and only receive 15 years for a number of things that, frankly, are, are pretty disturbing. So I'm wondering if we can discuss this offline. Vice Chair Feist. I'm happy to have conversations about this bill. It's a, it's a complicated bill. Um, all of the people that are going to be impacted by this bill did things that are, are going to be <laughs> unsettling to us. Um, that is who we are talking about. Um, I feel, um, I, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about the 15 years and kind of why we settled there as, as um, I think Representative Mueller mentioned and our experts can attest the actual length of time that it would take would be much higher than 15 years to go through this process. Um, but, and, I, and again, I'll just emphasize, some people are very much not going to be released as part of this process. This is just about giving them an opportunity. Um, and I know I've read through some petitions and read like beautiful moving poetry um, by people who've done really bad, disturbing things. You know, um, these are children. And, and I'll say a 17 year, 364 day, 
kid is still a kid. Like what we know about adolescent brain development is that it's really like not until we're like 25. Um, I feel like for me it was about 27 where we like actually like um, are a fully developed human. Um, so, you know, 17 year olds are still kids. And, and I, I would love to turn it over to my experts if they have anything else to say, especially Eric, if you have anything to say as somebody who's been through this process. Um, Mr. The Alexander, only, if, the, if that's yes, okay. uh, yes, Madam Chair, the only thing that I would like to add, uh, members of the committee, that for a child growing up in prison, Man, it's not easy to come out uh, the way that I came out. It takes a lot of time and investment, and you can actually lose your life because other inmates look at you very different because you're trying to change and turn your life around. I don't know if you know this, but children sentenced to lengthy sentence in any prison system are, are excluded from services that will help them become better people. So we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Uh, my family tore pages out of books and mailed them to me so that I could study developmental psychology while I was locked up because the system provided nothing for me. Um, so it was my own due diligence and my own desire to become a better person and to show the victim's family that I was not my worst act. Um, so children who grow up in prison, grow up under the worst circumstances, and those of us who change, change because our hearts desire to do so. And not all of us change in this capacity. So by any mechanism, be it uh, judicial review or parole boards, they're gonna sift the good from the bad and those like myself, which now represent over 900 individuals return to society. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move on now to Representative uh, Frazier. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I was listening. I don't know if I can say it better than what, what you just said about the fact that there's gonna be a review and they're gonna have a chance to look back to see what this individual who has now been in prison for 15 years how are things changed now? That's a long period of time to grow and to change. And uh, I know this, this letter is here from the MCAA, and I, and I know that it's not representative of all of the prosecutors. And I also, what I don't know, first one, can you come up for a second? Certainly. I don't really want to call on anybody else. Oh, we sorry. need to get out of this okay, room. Then, then yeah, I'll, sorry. I'll Maybe you can ask him offline. I'll just make this point. I'll just make this point. Uh, what, I, what I don't know um, for this letter is, how many of those individuals they've actually looked into to see what they've done since they've been incarcerated? Because that's what this is about. This is about giving someone the ability to go through a process where they review what has happened since that time that they've been incarcerated. And I think we should be giving our youth that chance. I think Representative Mueller said it best. Rehabilitation, it's in the Bible, right? It's a lot of us saying that we're, we're a Bible, God-fearing people. And we should, if, if, if that's the case, Let's live out those values and, and provide the rehabilitation. And I don't know if you could answer that question, but uh, Vice Chair Feist, about the, the letter from the county attorneys. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I, I will say that I think that letter was striking and that it just listed facts that have happened in most cases, maybe all cases, many, many years ago. So they do not take into account um, the, the development, the self-reflection, um, the restitution, um, and the growth of the individuals in that letter. Thank you. All right, uh, Lee Navani. Thank you, Chair Muller. I want to record, uh, recognize, uh, and based on the accent, that I just had a great conversation with you yesterday, so I'll recognize you as the gentleman from Tennessee and the gentleman from Texas. <laughs> um, very enlightening, um, good conversation, which we could have had more time. As I spoke with them yesterday, um, I think it became obvious that we're, we're talking apples to oranges. Um, Mr. Alexander's case in a different state with, with his particulars in the state of Minnesota, especially now and especially with provisions that we're planning on, and we not inclusive, are planning on doing this session to, to change things on, on felony murder laws, um, they just, they're not apples to oranges and we really can't look at it that way. It, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but we just look at the recent murder trial that uh, involved an execution, planned execution, and these children are being charged out as EJJs and, and are going to be free by the time they're 22. But I'm just going to be clear, and, and as I told them yesterday, it's, it's the whole totality of all the things and all the bills that are coming 
if this bill was just standalone, if we if we sat down this summer and didn't take it in the consideration with anything else, even at 15 years, I'd, I'd probably say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go with this. Um, county attorneys recommend 25. I, I don't know if that's too much, but here's what I'm going to take away from the totalitary, every the total of all the bills that are coming through this this session. And I'm just going to say that I think we need to be clear that the current law is holding someone responsible for violent crimes they commit is affirming for the life of the victim and potentially life-saving if it prevents another victim. When children who are violent criminals tell us who they are, it is our job as members of the Public Safety Committee to listen to them and to believe them. Thank you, Chair. Closing remarks, Vice Chair Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee, for hearing this bill that, that is deeply important. We have a status quo that is unconstitutional, um, and, and this is something that, that Minnesota has been trying to do now for 13 years, um, and it's, it's something that 27 other states have already figured out, and, and I do think it's important that we also figure it out. And so if people have uh, thoughts and they want to have conversations with me, I'm really open to those. Um, I want to get this done this year. And I thank our experts for traveling from Tennessee to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And I will renew my motion and lay over House File 1300. Also, we'll thank our testifiers. Have a safe travel home and more sunshine and warmth that waits you where <laughs> when you return, I'm sure. Um, and members, thank you again for the long week we've had, the great discussions we've had, the respectful discussions we have. There probably are donuts and coffee left over uh, in the back room if you didn't grab some or want a second round. Go for it. And with that, we are adjourned.